Reporting in progress. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the State Street Advisory Committee, March 18th, 2024. Hope everybody's enjoying the weather, because I am. Uh, could I have a roll call of the uh, Advisory Committee, please, Greta? Chair Dave Davis. Here. Vice Chair Ken Saxon. Here. John Bauke. Here. Diane Black. Here. Hillary Blackerby. Here. Roger Durling. Here. Nadra Ehrman. Here. Robin Elander. Here. Ed Lenvik. Present. Peter Lewis. Here. Kristen Miller. Here. Suzanne Tejada. Kristen Snedden. Here. Megan Harmon. Mike Jordan. Michael Becker. Here. Marge Caparelli. Great. Thank you very much. We do have a quorum, and we will then go into A, opening remarks. Um, Ms. Harris, would you like to report to us, and I'm not to embarrass you, your status today? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> if I stand up, you will notice I am, I am very much pregnant, <laughs> um, and we'll be having a little one any day now. Um, hopefully not tonight. Um, <laughs> But with me, I have Timmy Bolton and Dan Gullett. Um, Timmy's the project planner, project planner that's been working on the State Street Master Plan, and Dan is the Long Range um, Planning Manager. And both of them will be stepping in um, while I am temporarily out um, for personal matters, um, along with um, Eli Isaacson, the Community Development Director, who will be here shortly, and he also has been very involved in the process. So. Um, I, I look forward to being back soon with the committee and, and just thank you for uh, the time so far and, and I'll keep you all posted. Great, thank you. And congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Could I open with staff announcements, please? Yes, um, thank you, Chair Davis. So I wanted to first um, make an announcement welcoming our new um, State Street Advisory Committee member, John Bauke. We're really happy to have you here, John. Um, John is here as um, the Planning Commission representative. He's taking, um, taken over Roxana Bonderson's place, who, whose PC's term ended um, in December of 2023. Um, so I also want to thank Roxana for her time on the, commission, on the committee, um, and just happy to have John here today with us. Great. Welcome, John. Um, you want to say anything? No, just thank you. I look forward to working with all of you. Great. John and I go back away, so I'm, I'm really pleased to be working with you again. Okay. Uh, and then I have, I've got a few more items, if you don't mind. Go right ahead. So um, uh, just as a reminder to the community and to the committee, um, there are monthly interim operations um, reports to city council on State Street efforts. Those are the efforts that you're seeing on the ground today. So things like the bike lane configuration that's out on the street right now, the discussion around the Granada drop-off, um, the discussion around the request for proposals for a shuttle, um, that's anticipated this year, um, the configuration of the 1300 block in, the, in this sort of interim period. So I mention that because for anybody in the public that's interested in those specific issues, I would encourage you to reach out to City Council um, and participate in public comment during those meetings um, so they can get your, your comments on the interim efforts. Um, the other item I wanted to mention um, was a prior um, City Council um, item around Paseo Nuevo, and I mention this particular one because of its location in the uh, master plan project area. So the uh, Paseo Nuevo item went to City Council on March 5th. That was for a Surplus Lands Act exemption and for Council to sign off on a project agreement, which essentially was allowing the lender, Alliance Bernstein, to continue to invest in the design process. And really that, that set the stage as a starting point um, uh, and a step closer to a formal application being submitted by Alliance Bernstein. Um, and the relevance is that it's, um, is that it's in the, it's within what we right now are calling the city center. You can see it highlighted in the red portion. Um, and just a lot of opportunities um, if that project comes through for, for a further investment downtown. Um, and so more to come on that. Again, that will be going back to um, City Council throughout the process of, of that project, but just making this group aware that that is, a, is a, an item also um, happening in the city. 
And that, those are my um, staff announcements. Good, you want to continue with the, uh, the agenda review for tonight? Um, yes, so um, we have a few things we're going to um, talk through. We'll start out with a general update on the master plan process and overall timelines. Um, we will then have uh, feedback to staff on the four guiding principles as well as uh, the core strategies that were discussed. Um, the feedback on the overall process of the small, of the SSAC small working groups um, and just kind of how they went and, and discussing how we might use those again. Um, we'll do a recap of the three district concepts that um, that we've talked about before and then a short discussion on the naming of the districts just so that um, everybody can really begin to think about how we might um, finalize names for those districts and um, we'll talk about that and then the most of the time is going to be spent on updates to um, sketches and some of the graphic elements to help convey design ideas um, that are really based on the work efforts of SSAC to date as well as some of the work that MIG has helped um, the SSAC and staff with. That will be led by um, a, a wonderful group behind me of um, eight local architects that have volunteered their time and I'll introduce them at that point as well. Um, but they will be, they will be uh, talking about that. Great. And that, that'll be our agenda. Good, thank you. Next item on the agenda is the approval of our minutes for the meeting of October 23rd, 2023. Are there any questions or comments on those minutes? Kristen. Um, thank you, Chair Davis. I was in attendance and I don't show on the members present list. Any other questions or comments? Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Is there a second? Okay, Mo there's motion, second, roll call vote, please. John Bauke. Abstain. Diane Black. Uh, yes. Perfect. Hillary Blackerby. Aye. Roger Durling. Aye. Nandra Ehrman. Aye. Robin Elander. Yes. Ed Lenvig. Uh, yes. Peter Lewis. Yes. Kristen Miller. Yes. Suzanne Tejada. Aye. Kristen Snedden. Um, yes, and that's clear in the motion that it's with the change that my attendance is present. Thank you. Chair Davis? Yes. Vice Chair Ken Saxon? Yes. Great motion. The minutes are approved. That Ted, takes us to it's a couple item. of us you missed, Tess. Did you call my department? Excuse me? Did not call Part, pardon the interruption. We do need to get one more vote. Sorry about that. Uh, Megan Harmon, could you vote on the minutes of October 23rd? Thank you. I think me too. Thank you. I'll say yes too. Greta. I'll Thank say you. yes also. Thank you very much. Now we have approval. <laughs> Thank you all. Takes us to general public comment. Tess, do you want to handle that? Yes. So we have a, a few general public comment speakers. Before I um, read out the ones that we have in the room, um, if you would like to make a general public comment on an item that's not on the agenda today, there's a blue slip in the back. You're welcome to fill it out and bring it on up to us. Um, that's the same process that we will have for the agenda item. I'll start out with general public comment um, received um, the, prior to the hearing. Um, so we had Bert Swanson, Ron Robertson Jr., Joshua Vukovic, Anthony Grumbine, Carl Hutterer, Molly Pearson, Sullivan Israel, three, Aaron Ashland, three, Mike Jordan, Don O'Brien, Gaia Many, Ian Gamblin, Johnny Douglas, Eric Thune, Richard Yates, Tina Tikaya, Karen Rager, Leslie Hollis Lopez, Guthrie Leonard, George Gabaret, Timothy Fouch, two, Kira Push, Hannah, Ubaldo Rodriguez, Julia Nguyen, Claire Jacobs, Gordon Blasco, Joan Livingston, Chloe Cho, John Cavanaugh, Jenna Wolf, Summer Switzer Smith, Dana Hansen, two, Melissa Cunningham, John Sentinel, E. Moore, Tristan Miller, Molly Pearson, Monifa, and then there were uh, three distributed um, that will be distributed after the hearing that we've received so far. There may be others that we've received after the nine o'clock cutoff time this morning, and those so far that we have listed include Norma Rojas, Randy Wilson, and Richard Yates. 
You know, I just want to take a minute just to thank the community for how much input we are getting, even between meetings. We're getting uh, just a really good amount of input. So thank, thank you to the community. You can continue. So then we have uh, a few different public comment speakers under general co public comment. The first, um, I'm going to um, list off four names um, who have asked to speak briefly um, in sequence related to the CEC ecological framework. So um, Dennis Allen to introduce, and then Tristan Miller will have two minutes, followed by Dennis Allen with two minutes, Carl Hutterer with two minutes, and St Steve Windiger with two minutes. So if you'd like to come up to the podium. Good afternoon, I'm Dennis Allen. We're going to be presenting about the ecological guidelines that have been approved by the Community Environmental Council. And we have Tristan Miller who will speak first and then I'll speak second. Uh, Carl Hutterer will speak third and then Steve Windhager will speak fourth, thank you. Do you have, do you have their, their PowerPoint? Right there. there you go, thank you. <laughs> Is there a way you could advance it? And one more. Uh, thanks to everybody for coming to the CEC event that we had last week. We had such a good showing and I uh, hope you got a chance to explore this framework in detail um, at that event. We also have it on our website, but basically we want to make sure that the future of State Street is resilient and that anything that we end up coming out of this meeting and this whole planning process uh, results in a vibrant city. Next. So I'm talking about two of the main components of this framework, which is the 15-minute city and transportation. So the 15-minute city, essentially what we would like to see is a city where you can get any of your needs done within 15 minutes of walking or biking to anything, whether it be your groceries, going out with your friends, going to an event. It should be happening within 15 minutes. And to have this, State Street needs to be a diverse mix of businesses housing on State Street and services, and spaces for public gathering. Next. And importantly, State Street really needs to include transportation options other than cars. Specifically, there should be bikes allowed on State Street. It is a vital transportation corridor. And also, no cars as it is today, as it is the, most, the way to build the most vibrancy. And all of the studies that have come uh, out about bikes have shown that bikes on State Street or promenades like State Street actually increase spending at businesses, not reduce it. In addition, we want to make sure that there is good connectivity to the neighborhoods around it for bikers and walkers, as it is an equity issue that other parts of our city should be able to get easily to State Street. Um, that's it for my section. Next slide. Housing is definitely coming to Santa Barbara because of the state mandate. Um, and the more of that that we could have in our downtown corridor, the better it'll be for the economic vitality of our entire city. Uh, it needs to be a great mix of housing. Housing for uh, students, for young professionals, for couples, for families of various and all sizes, and for empty nesters. And these need to be a, a robust mix of uh, affordable and middle income and upper income. The more people who live downtown that don't have to have long commutes, the, the less congestion there will be and the better air quality. But the real opportunity we see is creating a sustainable building guidelines for the city that go beyond the building codes. Uh, it should encourage new and remodeled housing to be all electric and that this electric, electricity should be produced from solar panels and tied into uh, a micro grid to be developed because it doesn't yet exist on State Street. And this would make our energy sources more resilient for all of our housing and businesses downtown. We think that there should also be a decoupling between parking and living units. This would make those people that uh, are living downtown that don't have cars have more affordable rents at, or a lower purchase price. This has not been done, but we think there should be a 
uh, a plan showing the movement of cooling breezes and, and ventilation through all the habitable rooms in any new housing. Uh, this would reduce the amount of mechanical cooling that would be required. We also think that it would be great to have a matrix showing all the materials that are used in every project, every development, and, and these should uh, track the carbon of each of these materials. Uh, the embodied carbon of materials is the sum of what's used in mining or harvesting or transportation manufacture of materials. And uh, if, as these are all tallied up, you get a total carbon footprint, basically, of a, a, a new building or remodel project. And this uh, could be uh, shown to be a, a lower carbon footprint. In fact, the city might even want to require that it be below a certain level. But it's possible now to build new construction where you actually have a negative uh, carbon footprint. OK, thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Carl Hutterer, followed by Steve Windiger. Thank you. What is the most important task the revitalization of State Street and downtown has to accomplish? <clears throat> it has to enable our city to survive and thrive in the era of climate change. There's nothing more important than that. If you lose that game, our city is lost. The renewal of downtown needs to meet a dual challenge to reduce our city's carbon footprint to net zero and to increase our resili resilience to the impacts of climate change that will continue to grow. These two challenges are tightly inter interrelated and much of the response to them converges in the arena of infrastructure. <clears throat> infrastructure systems need to provide more effective and more robust services while consuming fewer resources and less energy. Just to mention a few examples, District systems should be designed to help manage the twin uh, uh, problems, the twin threats of floods and droughts. The great expanse of roof area should be converted to solar, to solar roofs as much as possible and all new homes should be electric and tied into many grids. District-wide stormwater capture could help manage flooding while providing water for landscaping during the dry months. Rather than being a heat island, we done? rather than being a heat island, the design of, the, of streets and, and buildings should channel cooling ocean bridges, uh, uh, ocean, ocean uh, breezes up into, into the city and cool it down. Thank you. All right, next slide. And I uh, apologize, looks like our slides and our speakers got a little bit out of order, but we appreciate your, your, your uh, bearing with us. I'm here to, to sort of close it off by saying, let's start by building really smart and use ecosystem services, those things that nature gives us for free, uh, to be able to reduce our overall energy use and make our buildings more livable, make our community more livable. This means increasing our tree canopy in the downtown area to cool those temperatures and improve those breezes. We talked about capturing breezes coming in off the coast and making sure they can make their way into our buildings. As we think about planting more things downtown, let's reuse our wastewater, things like air conditioning Condensate that we're creating on a regular basis, we create thousands and thousands of gallons a day in the summertime of air conditioning condensate that can be going to water those street trees and other benefits in downtown. The key is if we think about this smart as a multimodal space that is perfect for people, that is perfect for communities, that is a place where you want to live and a place you want to come back to again and again, nature has a really important role to play in that area. And so we want to make sure that this incorporates that strategy as part of this. Last slide. And I just want to say that we're coming here not just as ourselves, as four individuals representing CEC, but we're also representing a number of other organizations that have already signed on and are supporters of this framework. I'm excited to see that many of the concepts we've already talked about here are already represented in the draft concepts that are coming out. We support that. Thank you for your, so much for your work. And if there's anything we can do to help you out, we will stand ready. Thank you. Thank you. For general public comment, is Philip Henius? Philip? Followed by. Yeah, my name is Philip Henius, and I've uh, been a resident of Santa Barbara since 1974. 
and have uh, watched State Street st struggle pretty much all those years, except for a slight renaissance when uh, they built Pacero Nuevo for a while. Um, I just want to um, mention that I think it's time to really think out of the box. I am speaking in opposition of any cars or bicycle traffic being on State Street itself. I think it's important that bicycles um, have access to State Street. Um, they've got bike lanes now since the street has been closed. Uh, it's still kind of uh, a problem on State Street with the bike traffic, even with the designated bike lanes. Um, but I do think it's important that people are able to access um, by, by bicycle. I think there needs to be adequate parking for bicycles, um, and just like there is for people that come in their cars. Um, I really think, like I said, it's time for some out-of-the-box thinking. There's a lot of other very successful projects in the nation that do not have bicycle uh, or uh, uh, car traffic going up and down the streets. Um, Pearl Street and Boulder is a great example. Third Street, Promenade in Santa Monica is another one. The downtown mall in Charlottesville is a great project. Uh, the development of uh, Broadway Street in Eugene right now is also another great example. Um, the federal plan in, in Youngstown. Um, all are very successful and I could go on and on about many projects that do not actually have bicycle traffic going up and down their malls um, or car traffic that are very successful. Um, I don't think it's really compatible with, um, <clears throat> with pedestrian traffic. Um, and um, <clears throat> I, I think it's time for a big change. Um, so I would say really try to think about ways that we can achieve the goals of CDC and all the members uh, and players that are involved in this and still be able to have a project where the pedestrians, it's very pedestrian friendly, but also bicycle friendly and car friendly without having the bicycles and the cars on State Street itself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next public speaker under general public comment is Marilyn Loperfito. You want to call the next one before they, they, they know who's coming? That, that is the last one I have in the audience. If anybody is wishing to speak under general public comment, please bring your slip up um, in the next minute. We'll transition to online after that. Great. Good to go. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Marilyn Loperfido. I would like to state that I'm a 44-year member of the Santa Barbara Arts and Crafts Show. The reason I come to you today is because I'm hoping we can uh, build a partnership between the two entities, um, our show and this group, and uh, ultimately the re-envisioned State Street, which I think is an amazing, amazing program. The um, reason I'm speaking to you is that I think there's an assumption that as a Sunday show we are very busy, but in fact we've become more isolated and our attendance has become dramatically lessened as a result first of COVID, but now with, unfortunately, the um, closure of State Street, which again, I think is gonna be a great thing. Um, so because we've become more isolated, I know it looks like we might be busy, but in fact, we are slower than ever, and most of our business occurs between 11 and 12.30, and then the rest of the day, we just kind of wait for somebody to come by. Um, I think the vision can also be um, a wonderful partnership between our two entities. We have so much to add to what's now um, a blight in State Street in regards to the arts, the crafts, live entertainment, and, and bringing, bringing beauty to the city. Um, I'd ask that maybe we envision a, a bustling partnership with us on Saturday is much like the current farmer's market has on Tuesdays so that we can fill the gap that now exists but ultimately when everything is said and done it would be a terrible unintended consequence if we are isolated and left to ourselves and really have uh, nothing to do. So thank you, thanks for listening and I brought, finally brought my contact information for a printout for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now transition to online general public comment. 
Thank you. We do have three raised hands online. Michael Giannino, Lorian Davey, and Aaron Ashland. Michael Giannino, I'll unmute you and you'll have two minutes to speak. One moment. And Lily in the audience, I apologize. After we do um, public comment online, I will come back to, to your uh, slip. Michael Giannino, you can speak now. Okay, I just wanted to support bike riding on State Street. I'm 67 years old. I ride my bike on State Street a minimum of five days a week. And, you know, we hear all these complaints about the bikes being unruly and this, that, and the other. My problem with riding on State Street is that pedestrians cross the street. They don't look left. They don't look right. They just walk into the bike lane, sometimes right in front of you. So it's a two-way street as far as, you know, pedestrians and bike riders. And if everybody would be more cognizant of themselves, I don't think we'd have a problem. I also know that there's a lot of young kids on the bike paths and stuff being unruly, and that's going to happen, I think, any place. But I just want to say that, you know, I wouldn't go to State Street if I couldn't ride my bike on it. Um, it's where I do most of my shopping. And, uh, you know, as a bike rider, the pedestrians make it very dangerous for us, too. So that's just my point of view. Thank you. Lori and Davey, you're the next speaker. I'll unmute you and you'll have two minutes. Lori and Davey, go ahead and speak. I, um, I wanted to agree with the uh, speaker before me who um, opposed bikes on the uh, pedestrian um, mall on State Street. And I am also a, a devoted biker, bikey. Um, but I think that um, there's a better solution for uh, bikers, bikies having access to State Street. And that would be a, a good compromise to have uh, class one bike paths installed on Anna Kappa and Chapala Streets so that the uh, Anna Kappa Street bike lane would go one way uh, towards the ocean and the uh, Chapala Street bike path would go the other way. And then they, uh, they all could have access to the State Street Promenade and they could dismount their bikes and walk them if they wanted to continue along State Street. I think otherwise it's causing uh, too many conflicts um, with pedestrians, as the previous speaker pointed out. Um, and uh, there's no no reason that uh, bikies who want to go on State Street couldn't walk their bikes um, along the pedestrian mall. Thank you. We have two more raised hands, Aaron Ashland and Anna Marie Gott. Aaron Ashland, I will allow you to speak and you'll have two minutes, one moment. Aaron Ashland, go ahead. Uh, thank you for your time and efforts towards making what we all hope is going to be a vibrant and inclusive State Street Promenade. I read somewhere that the purpose of the committee was to explore pedestrian friendly designs for the future, but I feel that we have been handcuffed to a design that won't work by our traffic department or a traffic engineer. I believe the problem comes from what we learned at one of the very first MIG presentations about what I believe was our, the, our, the survey results of our residents. However, they said there were a couple of universal truths about areas like our promenade. First was that people wanted to be safe. With declining police staffing and the popularity of electric bikes and throttle bikes, both have made the entire promenade unsafe for basically anyone that isn't riding an electric bike and wearing a helmet. The second thing we learned was that people visiting a promenade want to be around other people. This makes sense to me. If you want to go have lunch on a patio and people watch, it wouldn't be much fun if there weren't any people to watch. So why do I think the current design for the promenade with bikes in the center of the design will be problematic? I love bikes. My restaurant is bicycle themed and I think we should favor bikes over cars when possible. But we already have a very bike friendly city. We need a bunch of bike racks on every block, but we don't need to give them the middle of State Street. It is not going to create vibrance. 
Once a bike has gone by in a second or two, would you consider the empty bike lane to be vibrant? I wouldn't, but somehow the current design is offering that as part of the solution to making downtown vibrant. It won't work because it simply isn't true. The middle of the entire promenade will feel empty 99.9% .9 of the time. Not good for feeling vibrant. Now consider a table in that area or a patio. What about people walking around safely without being in the fear of running over? All of these options would create more of a vibrance than a bike lane will ever. Shouldn't we offer the same feelings of safety to the visitors of the promenade as we offer to those who visit Shoreline Park? Shoreline Park has, quote, walk your wheels, unquote, posted all over. Shouldn't people who use canes, walkers, strollers, and wheelchairs also be able to enjoy the center of State Street? If the current design with bikes and scooters racing up and down the middle of the street is so safe, then why haven't walk your wheels signs been removed from Shoreline Park? My main concern is, yep, one more paragraph, sorry. My main concern is that it, what, but it must be arrogance. I say this because we have an example like Boulder, Colorado, and we think we're smarter than them. But most other cities that, okay. We have one more raised hand. Anna Marie Gott, I'll unmute you and you'll be able to speak. One moment. Anna Marie Gott, go ahead and speak. Good afternoon, committee members. Uh, I would just like to re reiterate some of the comments that some of the previous speakers have made, which is we should not allow bicycles on State Street. Um, we have a number of people who, who I have witnessed actually going down State Street um, instead of single file, um, four and five people across. And there are supposedly, you know, new rules out, but we also don't have anyone that is actively enforcing the new rules of how people should behave on State Street. It is quite frankly still dangerous. It will continue to be dangerous. And I'm just waiting until there's a lawsuit <laughs> because that will happen at some point when someone is seriously injured. Um, Pedestrians and bicycles in the same area just, you know, do not mix well. And I really highly recommend finding a solution that allows um, for people to park their bikes so they can park and walk. That's what we should be doing. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we have any other public comment? We have no additional public comment. Oh, I apologize. After I thought. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, Lily Heidger um, in the audience. Thank you, Lily, for your patience. Hello. Um, I want to speak in favor of a car-free State Street that also includes multi-mobility. Uh, car-free spaces are so incredibly important to healthy and happy cities, and especially in such a special place like Santa Barbara. This means that it's space for kids to walk, run, roll, and play while parents shop in existing comfort. It's a place where people can quite literally breathe a little easier without interacting with cars and their subsequent air pollution. A healthy State Street also includes bikes. As a commuter bicyclist, I find State Street to be an oasis where I can bike without the worry of car interactions. State, uh, Santa Barbara downtown is, is a great bike city, but I encounter cars on a daily basis, even in, uh, on streets that have bike infrastructure, whether it's the uh, possibility of being doored or uh, people crossing into the bike lane. State Street just allows me to breathe easy and access all of the different uh, amenities that it has to offer. It also acts as um, a thoroughfare to allow folks to get from places. Just the length of it um, in totality is a long distance for someone to travel as a pedestrian alone. Um, I'd, on, I'd be much less likely to interact with State Street to the extent that I do if I weren't allowed to bike onto it because it's my main mode of transit and parking it and getting all the way to the funk zone or getting to the other end of it would be much more difficult. I think this is an inclusivity aspect as well that allows different abilities, uh, people with different abilities to access the entirety of State Street and the entirety of downtown Santa Barbara and really interact with all that it has to offer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, we have no additional general public comment. Great, Slips. thank you. We will close the public hearing. We will then move into our regular agenda item, 
is item A, the update on create state master plan process, a timeline, and we'll move then into the graphic elements. Tess, you want to take Great, it from here? Great, thank you. So I'm going to start us off with a quote that um, our chair has used before, and that's a quote from Hal Conklin, who's a former mayor. Um, and the quote is that Santa Barbara should evoke a sense of place, a sense of history, and a sense of celebration. And I open that, I, I am starting with that quote because I think that really encompasses what we are here to do um, today and over the next uh, year as we finalize the master plan. I'm also going to just highlight the, the a short vision statement that we have um, that the committee has agreed on and that it's really stemmed from a conversation that we had a, a while ago about um, what State Street and what the Create State Master Plan should include, what it is, what it feels, what it provides, what it reflects, and what it represents. Um, and so just to sort of set the stage for, um, for all of us tonight, um, Create State leverages the history and experiences of downtown and State Street to sustain continued investment in the public space for decades to come. It establishes a programming focus with art, culture, and civic engagement, emphasizes economic activity and new opportunities for ec economic growth downtown, attracts residents and visitors alike, and is an inclusive public space geared towards all who want to experience the vibrancy and enjoyment of downtown and the State Street area. So I'm, I'm now going to go into what staff has been. Before I do that, I want to also highlight that we are when we talk about the Create State Master Plan area, we are talking about um, a project that's within the El Pueblo Viejo Landmark District. Um, so there are, there are many historic resources within that space, um, and it really has, a, there's an emphasis on the importance of design in our, in our downtown area. And so that's something just to take through as we're having this conversation, and we'll get a little more into that in the second part um, of the agenda item. The other thing, just to re, kind of, but just to mention, make sure we all understand this project, um, is encompassing the public space area from um, Sola down to the 101 underpass, and then Chapala to Anacapa Streets. Um, and I want to emphasize that we are really focused in the Create State Master Plan on the public space. So we're looking at the 80 feet of, of right of way and how we can um, create this space that ultimately drives investment. Um, in private, private um, parcels as well, um, and is, is a community space first and foremost. Um, so getting into what staff have been working on. So over the past few months, we've been drafting um, the master plan, and we expect to have that out. Um, I'll show a timeline in a moment um, that walks through that. Um, we've also been convening in small working groups with SSAC, State Street Advisory Committee members, to talk about some of the uh, guiding principles and core strategies that um, Timmy Bolton will share with us in a moment. Um, we've been working on technical reports uh, with our MIG team and city staff. We have a representative from MIG that's joining us via Zoom, that's um, Matt Schawaker. He's their project manager for this project, so I'm happy to have him um, listening in and participating in this conversation as well tonight. Um, and then we um, have been working on updated graphics, and that's what you'll hear from um, in the second part of this, um, really working um, with a, a local, a group of local architects that have volunteered their time very graciously and um, help, are helping to what I think is really bring the, the Santa Barbara flavor and the poetry into um, the design work. So this is um, just a, a quick snapshot of the um, table of contents, and I recognize that if you're in the back, it's probably very hard, if not illegible, to read. Um, but just so that you get a sense for how we are envisioning laying out the master plan document and how, we, how we've already progressed in that effort. So we are starting out, um, the first section is really the executive summary, our plan for success. What's the, what are the high level points? If you were to pick the docu document up, and read that section, you would know what the entire document um, is really proposing in a, in a quick snapshot. Um, the next is the introduction and context, talking about our history, the evolution of downtown, how we got to be here, where we are today, and that's not just from COVID, and um, it, it really stems back from uh, more than decades ago, from nearly a century ago, and then in the 1960s when 
Um, the general plan, the first general plan for Santa Barbara in 1964 was created. There was a mention of um, this downtown core area and rethinking of it in, in a different zone, a car-free space. That continued in um, the redevelopment era um, and, and there was a conversation again in the 70s and we're bringing it back um, as well. So I highlight that just to emphasize that there's a lot of history to this project. This is not coming just from um, the last few years, but really coming from the last century. Um, we then get into the different um, strategy, the different guiding principles, excuse me, that we'll talk about in a moment. So focusing on people and placemaking, economic vitality, mobility, utilities, and function, and sustainable design and resiliency. Um, and within those guiding principles, we have um, set strategies that um, the committee is working on, on refining. And then they'll be implementing action items. Um, you can think of them sort of like policies on how we want to implement um, those specific strategies and guiding principles and really bring them um, onto the street and into the public space. Um, then we will get into all of that really sets the stage up for um, the design scheme and what the design looks like really as a whole and then within the three different district areas that we've talked about um, through this project and we'll emphasize those districts there and then have the street streetscape design scheme um, fleshed out there. That leads into the implementation plan or how we make it happen and that's, um, there's a lot to that. There's a lot of meat there. So thinking about what um, types of phasing do we want to have? How do we want to identify immediate wins, short-term goals, medium-term goals, and long-term um, opportunities in the space? Um, and then also focusing on ongoing maintenance and operations and safety. So recognizing that there needs to be a bit of a different structure for if we're going to create a space like this, how are we going to actually manage it and how does, what does that difference look like from what you're seeing today? So that, will, that section we'll talk about that. And then there will be a number of different technical reports, uh, again, that we've been working on um, that really just backs up some of the, those key elements there. Um, so then going into the um, create state timeline that we have over the next year. So we are, we are um, today, March 18th, we're discussing the overall process. We'll be talking about graphics and the Paseo system. Um, and then over the next few months, we plan, our, uh, we plan to continue to work with the State Street Advisory Committee members in working groups. Um, as we are working through uh, specific sections of the plan to try to identify um, just different areas that we might need to tweak or, or there might be um, input and then that will come back to the full committee for all input um, as well as the general public. Um, all of those meetings would be uh, reported out. Um, and then we plan to have additional State Street Advisory com Committee meetings like this one, um, but we do plan to do them um, one in the summertime and then again at the end of the year. So the real focus in bringing the whole group together will be discussing the draft master plan in the summer um, as well as the what we hope to, to bring forward as the final plan by the end of 2024. Um, so when we release the draft plan to the State Street Advisory Committee, um, again we anticipate that in summer, a summer time frame, so um, estimating a July time frame at the moment. Um, and then public review is anticipated for approximately 60 days um, after that. And so we would take the State Street Advisory Committee's feedback, incorporate it into the draft, re-release it out to the public for at least a couple months over the summertime, so August to likely October. Um, and during that time frame, we'll have open forums and conversations. We'll be doing different public outreach components. Um, we'll also be going to the committees and commissions within the city um, to talk through their comments and feedback for the State Street Advisory Committee to consider. Um, we'll bring that all back um, with recommendations on the final plan and we anticipate that by the end of the year um, and are hoping to get a, a recommendation, a vote from the State Street Advisory Committee to then take that recommendation forward to City Council and that will happen shortly thereafter, sometime between the end of this year um, and early 2025 and we hope to have an adoption at that point. Um, so moving in, just highlighting again the small working groups. Um, so we broke up the State Street Advisory Committee and um, into small working groups and asked 
um, and into these four different groups. So economic vitality, housing, placemaking, and mobility, utilities, and function. Um, and walked through some of the guiding principles and strategies that we are going to talk about in a moment um, to get feedback. And so one of the, the key things that we are wanting to hear from this first part um, at the end of, of the presentation will be if we've, if we've hit the right notes in terms of the guiding principles and strategies. We recognize that we'll still be working through the implementing actions or policies with the committee members um, and have been doing so um, through over the last month, a couple months since we've met. Um, but we want to make sure we're setting the foundation as we keep moving forward and reiterating that. Um, so now I will turn it over to Timmy Bolton, who will walk us through the uh, four guiding principles that we've come out so far. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Tess. So yeah, as Tess mentioned, um, we have the following four guiding principles up here that we really use as a way to frame the community vision, what we've heard from the input from the State Street Advisory Committee, and all we've heard through the community engagement process as a way to frame and implement that variance guidance, as well as what we think are the four foundational elements of great public space. So first and foremost, it needs to be designed for humans. There needs to be a unique place and space. Um, so to that end, um, we think people and placemaking are a key to downtown's ultimate success and long-term vitality. There needs to be a clear economic component to all of these things. And with State Street being a key driver, both locally and regionally, um, ensuring and enhancing that vitality downtown economically needs to be a core element um, to enhance long-term. And there's also a functional component to all of this. Transportation and mobility play a critical element to the success of downtown, as well as the supportive elements that will enhance existing as well as the future activities um, and interactions moving forward. And then this new one we added based on the um, SSC small groups as well as the input we've heard from the Community Environmental Council. And that's really we need to leverage sustainability and resiliency in the long-term design. So delving into these a little deeper, so we start with these higher level guiding principles and then with each one of these we have two to three sort of high level strategies to then guide the more detailed implementation actions to make those things happen. So within the realm of people in placemaking, um, foundationally it needs to be an accessible space. It needs to be designed for everyone from all ages and ability, from a young child to a retiree. It needs to incorporate universal design elements. It needs to be clean, self, safe, and welcoming for all. And it needs to be interesting, vibrant, and fun. We've heard the flat, flexible, and fun element throughout this process. We need to have um, you know, concrete reasons for people to come downtown and experience something new, have a real focus on performances and large-scale community events. Um, and we need to make sure it's uniquely Santa Barbara and deliberately El Pueblo Viejo. As Tess mentioned, we're in the EPV district, and one of the things that makes placemaking foundational is that unique experience. So we can leverage our unique history, our unique culture, our unique preferences, and make sure that when people come visit and live here, they have a unique experience through that. So then if we look at the implementing actions from those strategies, um, there's a number of things. We mentioned universal design, so that's the idea of removing barriers to make sure spaces are more accessible for all. Um, it's actively programming State Street as a dynamic event space for all. Um, we've talked a lot about throughout this process of having larger scale community events in the city center, perhaps. Um, and then really making sure it's a high quality pedestrian experience, designing things in a human scale environment, making sure the facades as one walks along are interesting, um, and making sure it's human scale, it's safe, it's clean, there's bathrooms, those types of elements. Um, as well as celebrating and honoring um, historic resources and the rich legacy we have here. And this is just a quick snapshot. We have a whole bunch more that will be coming soon, but just as a flavor of what we're talking about when we talk about guiding principles and strategies and then the more nitty gritty detail of how that implements. Shifting now to economic vitality. Um, you know, downtown is a critical commercial corridor. State Street has a long history of being a primary retail corridor, supported by all sorts of other industries retail, shopping, commerce, everything else. Um, and so a key strategy we think here is growing our existing businesses and cultivating new investment. So that's doing a number of things that range from expanding economic resources to enticing new investment to continue that economic generation downtown. A big one is catalyzing housing construction downtown. We've looked at it and um, you know, there's 
a strong desire to have a, a mixed-use neighborhood downtown. There's not as many housing units as we think there could and should be. There's a lot of policy direction through the housing element and other city efforts. Big incentive to make housing come downtown and it's critical for economic vitality to sort of neutralize the activity levels downtown and um, just really provide more people in that space. And then finally, activate the city center. Um, it's a foundational area that has such a rich history and good foundation. And there's a huge opportunity there to really focus and catalyze that area and start from a smaller concentrated node and build out from there to activate that location. So delving into the implementing actions, um, within the guise of expanding economic resources, there's a, certainly an opportunity to expand a variety of economic programs through additional government programs that could be bridge loans, could be leasing support, could be all sorts of things. Um, there's an opportunity we've heard to cultivate a business-friendly city government. We can change some of the permitting processes. We can reduce permit fees and timelines. Um, another big one is facilitating adaptive reuse of existing structures. We heard about that um, earlier tonight. It's great from a sustainability standpoint, so much more efficient environmentally to reuse what we got than build something new. Um, and then really transforming downtown into a mixed-use neighborhood with thousands of new housing units, which could be catalyzed from a variety of ways, including um, the redevelopment of Pasea Nuevo. Another example is um, really focusing the initial large-scale investments on the city center, so that central core. The idea being, in the research we've seen, a lot of places have um, had successful catalyzation by starting in a more consolidated effort, those initial investments, and then letting it organically grow from there. Switching now to mobility and utilities. Um, so again, mobility and utilities provide a central function downtown. And really, um, we want transportation to be a supportive component to that vital neighborhood, to that vital function and event space. Um, so critical to that, it's focusing on safety first and foremost. It needs to be safe for all. It needs to be well connected. You, we don't want downtown to be an island isolated from everything else. It needs to be connected to the waterfront, to the transit station, to our neighborhoods, to the rest of the region. And it needs to be fully accessible for those um, of all ages and abilities. And then it needs to be balanced out in that if we have certain areas that perhaps have less transportation options, there needs to be directly adjacent to that the supportive amounts. Or if there's some sort of restriction on automobile use during certain times or areas or locations, there needs to be a supportive function that gets folks to those areas still. And then finally, um, the critical component is strategically increase the utility capacity. So as we look to the future, um, you know, thinking about where we can leverage, where future housing is going to be, make sure we upsize both private and public utilities, where the large scale event spaces are going to be, making sure we have those supportive functions that if somebody comes in and wants to do a, an event, we already have the outlets there. We already have the space to roll in and out the stage and all the other supportive functions. So delving into the, some of the implementing actions we're thinking about, um, so that first one, designing State Street for safe, accessible, and leisurely travel. The idea there being State Street as a function, really it's not, uh, you know, it's not a freeway. It's folks who are going there to have something. It's safe, it's slow, experiential. And then the balance component of this that we just talked about is really then Chapala and Anacapa serve that, you know, counterpoint of the service, the function, the utilitarian travel and access and whatnot. Emphasizing gateways, we've heard a lot about that, especially in the context of rethinking the 400 block and really emphasizing that as the key gateway to and from the waterfront, but also including gateways to and from the neighborhoods from the other access points, um, perhaps in a less defined feature, but you know, making sure there's connections, gateways, people know when they're entering in this unique experiential space of State Street in our project area. Of course, we need to provide for emergency access, um, state law, I think we've gone through that a fair amount through this process. Um, and then effectively managing and balancing parking. We are unique and blessed to have all of the on-street and adjacent parking resources that access off Chapala and Anacapa. So making sure those are effectively managed to encourage folks to come and stay and shop and, and spend time downtown and make sure the on-street and off-street is all balanced and well managed. And then finally, designing infrastructure for future needs. So that's that element about um, making sure we have the right capacity increases where we can. If we're ripping up the street, put some extra conduit in, those types of things. And then finally, this new one, sustainability and resiliency. Um, so this was a subset of a previous guiding principle, but we elevated it through those discussions, as we mentioned. 
And really the idea here is that um, for long-term resiliency and success, it has to be both environmentally sustainably sustainable as well as from a management standpoint, as well as from everything else. So the first one is really focusing on making sure it's flexible, adaptable, and sustainable. So we've talked about some of those flat elements. We've talked about making sure we're prioritizing infrastructure improvements that can be used in a lot of different ways. So less fixed stuff that's obdurate, more flexible stuff that allows for the indeterminate future and so we can adapt throughout time. And then designing using less, being efficient about the resources we have and building partnerships um, for success. We have a lot of great institutions. Um, we can definitely expand our capacity and be most successful when we leverage those. And then the implementing actions from these, first and foremost, use flexible and adaptable design. Um, some of these next ones you might um, you know, be familiar with based on the CEC presentation, focus on some of the cooling effects, reduce urban heat island effects, um, focusing on permeable surfaces and way to improve stormwater, um, incorporating solar technology throughout any sort of public and private infrastructure improvement, making sure we electrify everything and make sure it's as sustainable as possible, um, incorporating stormwater best management practices, and then making sure we're reducing water use and using recycled water and those types of things. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Tess. Awesome, thank you, Timmy. So I'm now gonna talk through the different districts, just reminding us that we have three core districts that we've discussed as a group, and we've, I think, come to some consensus here on, um, on these three areas. So, and I highlight them just to show you that the three areas do cover State Street, that's the line in the center, um, but they're also covering um, Anacapa and Chapala Streets here. So the whole, the whole space, you can think of them almost like blocks with, um, within each area. And I bring that up because um, uh, really we've, we've talked about it a lot, but one of the things that I think um, we want to pose to the State Street Advisory Committee as well as the community is what should these areas be called? Um, and part of it is should they be called um, districts or zones or neighborhoods? So we've got the Funk Zone and the Presidio neighborhood, the El Pueblo Viejo Landmark District um, in our community. There's different, different ways of going about this, the type of space. Um, and then also we've had different ideas that have come through either through public comment or through a State Street Advisory Committee member or through staff or MIG. Um, and so these are just some of the, of the ideas up here. Um, at the end, if, if the committee has comments on that, certainly happy to take them. And then really opening it up to the community. If you have feedback, um, we would encourage you to uh, provide that as public comment. You're welcome to send in an email to the State Street Master Plan at santabarbaraca.gov. Um, and we also will likely have something on our website for you to easily be able to um, go in and, and input your idea for what um, a space, one of these three spaces could be called. So stay tuned for that. I just wanted to highlight that. Um, the other reason I wanted to highlight the districts is because it really um, plays into um, a lot of the work that we're going to hear about in just a moment. And so to start us off um, with the architect group, first I wanted to highlight um, the work of the AIA and the, the two design charrettes that had been um, done both in 2017 and 2020 and all of the really amazing work that um, that that group also volunteers have um, really spent so much time, put their heart and soul into what downtown could be. And um, if you haven't gone through the AIA design booklet from 2020, I highly encourage you to do so. There's a lot of great elements in there that this committee has taken and discussed and is continuing to look at. Um, and part of the reason that I highlight that is because the group that you're going to hear from in a moment um, really stemmed from the AIA design charrette. So they're a group of individuals that volunteered their time then um, through the AIA and have come to the city as well volunteering their time and working with city staff um, on um, this type, uh, kind of the, the feel and flavor of what the design could look like. Um, and so with this, um, just giving sort of a quick history during the last State Street Advisory Committee meeting and, and previously, we've heard from the committee members in the community that the, the drawings or the design up to this stage just doesn't quite feel like our community. There's something missing. And they have had a lot of um, technical elements in them um, and a lot of great components, but there was something just that was missing um, visually from capturing people's attention or making them feel like this was our home, right? So um, part of that 
um, meant that after talking with Chair Davis and a couple other committee members, um, staff, and Anthony Grumbine as the chair of the Historic Landmarks District, um, got together and spoke about, um, you know, how, how do we bring the Santa Barbara feel um, into, into this project and into our designs. Um, and Anthony graciously brought um, a number of other um, architects on board as well who had offered to join him in, um, in really helping to come up with, with different ideas for how we can present a lot of the elements that we've talked about over the last year plus. Um, so you will see some ideas today um, that are similar to what you've seen before, but they look different, the design feels different, and part of what we are asking is, is if that's resonating with the community um, anymore. Um, and then the, the group and staff will continue to develop design. So we've been meeting with this group since November. Um, over the last five months, we'll continue to do that as we um, work through up, leading up until the release of the draft plan and their ideas. So um, we want to hear from the community and we want to hear from the State Street Advisory Committee on what you like or what you want to see different, um, what things you might want to see added, um, and then if there are, are changes or, or tweaks or as we go through the design development process. Um, and so, um, with that, before we get in, I just want to, I want to quickly, um, Anthony will probably do this as well, but just highlight everybody over here um, sitting um, back. If you guys could all stand up just real quick, um, just highlighting all of, all of your work. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Anthony, but we've got Anthony Grumbine from Harrison Design. We've got Ching Su from Harrison Design, Alexis Stippa from Harrison Design, Fred Sweeney, Justin Manuel from Arcadia Studios. We have Mark Appleton and John Margolis from Appleton Partners. Um, and again, just really glad to have them here today to present. Um, and so I will turn it over to Anthony and, um, and, and we will have a discussion after that presentation um, and then take public comment at the end. Great, all right, thank you Tess. Um, all right. So uh, again, uh, thank you all to the team. Uh, it's been a really fantastic group, extremely talented colleagues um, that have donated their very valuable time. And uh, thank you for the many months and hard work and uh, to get us to here. Um, as was mentioned, um, let's see. Uh, oh, did we want to touch? Did, we, did you want, sorry, okay. touch? Sorry. Okay. Okay, well, I'll, I'll just continue as we go here. Um, so as was mentioned, uh, as has mentioned about the EPV, uh, one of our, our group's uh, thinking and challenges was really looking at um, what, what the work that's being done so far and really working it into Santa Barbara DNA. Uh, it, needs to, it needs to feel like Santa Barbara, and that was sort of our big, um, our big push and we where we were going with it. This is the EPV, this is the core of the city, this is, uh, it can't be much uh, more of an important uh, area, and so it really needs to feel fully like Santa Barbara. I also want to especially thank uh, Fred Sweeney, who basically came out of retirement to work full time <laughs> on this project pro bono, um, and so he really did a, a huge amount of the work effort as well as we reviewed o months and over the months. Um, as well, final thanks to the AIA charrettes. It was mentioned before the two work efforts, but those were thousands of hours of, of donated time um, and a really huge effort and really gave us a, a great starting point and a lot of the work um, that, that has been uh, gone into it as a foundation. So those are sort of jumping off points. Um, so what I want to talk about first is what you're not going to see. Um, so what this is, was, is not is it's not a specific design for what State Street should be or what the block should be in, at all. It's actually sort of a design strategy. So you're going to see sort of a toolkit and example blocks and example portions of State Street, but you're going to see sort of the toolkit that we're looking at that gives the, the, um, the means that can go forward so that if a property owner or the city and a property owner or a combination of various uh, ind individuals or groups uh, can make a portion work, they have to, uh, some tools in their belt to um, work on this. So um, this came from listening to the public, listening to uh, the SSAC and all of these uh, meetings, uh, the AAA, Shreds, et cetera, sort of has been combined uh, for all those. 
So what I wanted to give you is a, a brief overview of what you're going to see, and then hand it over to my colleagues for um, presentation. Uh, so the first, there's going to be a, a section that will see um, uh, individual, three individual sections of State Street. So you're going to see the State Street uh, types and different ways of the uh, transportation and, and integration of how the Paseos interact with State Street and the outdoor rooms that are created. So you're going to see three samples of those sizes. Um, the next uh, section that you're going to see is you're going to see the concepts of Paseos intersecting State Street. And I think this, is, this was a really an, a very exciting idea that really helped form the space of State Street in a subtly new way, and I think is a, an improved way and an interesting way that only Santa Barbara can actually do because we're the ones with the Paseo system. And so we have a very unique opportunity to actually make it inform our center spine and, our, and in, a, in a uniquely Santa Barbara way. Um, and then the third portion, um, as MIG noted, the Paseos uh, are, really need help, and that's a very, very clear. We did a Paseo study, and there's less than 20% of all the Paseos are actually really good Paseos. So what happens when you have a system that doesn't actually connect you from a good Paseo to a good Paseo to a good Paseo? No one uses it, or very, very few, few people use it. It's totally underutilized. So a core part of it is looking at the, the, the last section is looking at three different blocks as typical block cases that have the challenges that we have with our blocks. Some of them are poor Paseos, some of them are non-existent um, that just need to be built, um, and some of them are really great Paseos, and we looked at, uh, at sort of t uh, typical examples of blocks and what might be able to be done with that. So that's it for the quick summary, and with that I'll turn it over to my colleagues here, Fred and Justin. With just, oh, yeah. Yeah. And good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Is it all working? Oh, okay. Familiar faces. You live in this town long enough, you, you get to see everybody. I just wanted to say a couple of things. One, I'm very honored that Anthony invited me to be part of this group. I'm really just your draftsman. I'm trying to make the things look pretty and draw it all. Um, I'm actually retired from the city's oldest architectural firm, founded in 1906. Uh, the firm has done many, many buildings on State Street and elsewhere including my late partner, Roger Phillips, who did the Granada Theater rebuild, and the Vic, uh, Vic Theater, uh, and the Arlington when it was last renovated, uh, among many other things, county court, county administration building, et cetera. Um, and I retired as one of the chief uh, design architects for the firm. So uh, what I've been doing for the last uh, 250 hours counting since Christmas uh, is I've been diving into this thing. So I'm actually drawing a 27-foot long uh, drawing <clears throat> of uh, all of the 10 blocks of State Street. Uh, it kind of repeated the 25-foot drawing I did for our team when we did the AIA. So I'm knowing it really well now, and I did a little bit more work by going down and pulling all the parcel maps, so <laughs> that's interesting in itself. And then in addition, a while back, also volunteered my time to work on a six long block drawing of what we call upper state from Mission to Constance to get the parkway designated. So I've got a little bit of background and with that many hours you, and hand drawing all of this, you think a lot while you're doing it. So we want to go to, how do I do this, the next slide? How's that work? Where am I pushing? Okay. The, uh, the arrow to the right, right there? Okay. I'll let you push. You, you push, yeah, that would make it better. So, <clears throat> um, what we wanted to start off looking at is what happens when we start at the 400 block. That's uh, where Gutierrez, just as you come out of the, under the freeway, and you know there's a project underway. Can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, and so we came up with this idea of let's study what uh, various gateways might look like at State and Gutierrez. What would that do? How does that entice folks to continue uh, traveling up state, particularly from the waterfront, uh, after you dive under the, under the freeway? Next slide, please. So uh, one of the things that Justin is going to talk about is the, the issue that was already brought up earlier this evening. State Street needs to breathe. And one of the ways you breathe is through our trees and the planting. And it's going to be very important that we think about how to do that and how do we retain some of the specimens that are there, there today that are still valuable. Do we transform them? Do we plant them? You know, do we do different things? And then how do we introduce this 
idea of Mediterranean architecture that Santa Barbara has adapted, and we can see all these beautiful photographs around the room from the time that Santa Barbara developed as we know it today. So Justin, you want to talk a little bit about the landscaping sure. approach? Um, so as we all know, Santa Barbara is not just an um, uh, architectural showcase, but it's got um, a celebrated and time-honored um, and complementary um, landscape style to it. Um, and and uh, as we begin to try to fully characterize what Santa Barbara landscape style is, it's a little bit difficult, but in looking at the landmarks and the most notable examples, um, some commonalities begin to emerge. And there's a, a little bit of a loose play on symmetry, but there's more so a thoughtful balance of um, textures and, and colors and shapes and sizes um, of uh, at a zoomed out level of trees and at, at massings. Um, and so whenever we look at the broader sense of what Santa Barbara landscape looks like and with those elements considered, um, and we take inventory of what's actually on State Street, um, we, we can begin to, um, we don't want to change the good things that we already have going. And instead, uh, lean in on, on what's working really well, particularly in the spaces with the uses that are existing um, right now. Um, and so uh, we can kind of offer a bit of a categorization of, of um, like a typology of plant material for the different spaces and um, to further inform the planning progress. Um, next slide. Actually, I can just take that. Um, so this, this begins to form a rough categorization um, of what those could look like. Um, so along the bottom, it's <coughs> basically three categories um, broken out primarily by canopy height, um, and that's really going to start to inform the sense of scale for each space. And it's not a sense of scale imposed, it's kind of already existing if you go out and walk on State Street. Um, these are pretty common, um, but this is just a chance to really hone in on them and, and lean on them. So starting out um, on the middle of this more abstract map in the red area, um, right near De La Guerra, this is our more civic space. Um, so it's our least intimate scale. Uh, there's a lot going on, a variety of uses. Um, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to tend to want to be um, an area with a taller tree. Um, as we go on either side of it with the blue areas, we drop down in canopy height, um, or at least the sense of scale for those areas gives a sense that, that something smaller would be more appropriate. So something in this range and then going out from that in the yellow areas uh, these are areas where people are dining out we're all dining out more it's social spaces it's your most intimate area your most intimate scale areas um, and so it, it tends to be shorter trees um, closer to you sh and um, you can get a, a bit more shade canopy lastly um, this little cluster of trees which isn't intended to be on any big broad block or span any real long area, but um, it's intended to be uh, kind of a bookend. And there's these green squares, which I'm not sure if they show up too well in the back. Um, but as we start talking about gateways, these, these celebration or kind of an explosion of plant material, um, it's, it's very Santa Barbara, and it also gives a, a way to announce those, those gateways. And so in looking at gateways, we can go to the 400 block. So uh, what we did here is we took that, the formal announcement that you're at the beginning of a change at State Street right when you hit Gutierrez as you come up from under the underpass, and we do that by introducing the Allee of Palm Trees which we're all known for. Every photograph you ever see of Santa Barbara, they got pond trees, right? Well, we don't want to march that all the way up. This is not the Champs-Élysées. This is Santa Barbara. But it allows us to do that introduction, but also the fact that because the police and fire folks need to have traffic on Haley because of the couplets, one-way couplets, and on State. That's how they, they have to maintain that area at the bottom of State Street. Those all have to remain in place, but then the other opportunity is to introduce the bicycles, there's bike lanes on both sides, and then try to capture as much space as we can for outdoor dining on both sides of that street. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. 
So the other idea is the marketplace. Right now we have a Tuesday farmer's market, but we're hoping that uh, if we do it right, that will morph into availability of more days during the week that other type markets could occur, including an art market. Let's go to the next slide. These are, these are from, I'm sorry, these are from Europe. And the important part about these slides, particularly these two here, uh, the upper right and, and the bottom left, is that these are collapsible awnings, very much like the, the Costco tents they use today. And I spent uh, several evenings down taping and measuring with my little tape and taking photographs of what they put up today. And then we took a look at this. Uh, one is in Nice and I think the other one's in Paris. And uh, we could do that. These pop into the ground. They're, they've got a water available, electricity available. It's all infrastructure. Uh, but it's really a kind of a, a, a neat approach to about how to do that. Next slide, please. So we took back and talked about what I refer to as the Delaguerre District. Uh, from the Fiesta District uh, transition. And here's where we put in um, an area for, and I guess I have to use the little red, where is that on the, on the top? Okay. Okay. The circle. So the circle, there we go, okay. So these are those, those tents. So they line up on the shade side of Santa Barbara Street. And does everybody understand about how unique we are and how our state street is laid out. There's a shade side and there's a sun side. And when I was a little boy and got the, the chance to come on a big trip to Santa Barbara, uh, my mother and grandmother would walk on the shade side because that's where all the best stores were, okay? So we have to think about how we do that. And so we put the, the market on the shade side of El Paseo, which is basically here. This is state, uh, uh, excuse me, Delaguerra Street here and here that'll attach itself to Delaware Plaza up here. This is Stork Placita. And then here we have an emphasis, there's actually a, a propose, an idea of having a fountain there with water in it, um, who knew? Uh, and then uh, the 20 foot right away down the center of the street. Next slide, please. Oh, there's the fountain at the top. Oops, do I do that? There we go. Okay, and then this is the, uh, what I call the Bella de Artes district, for a working term. Uh, and this is showing uh, the art museum, uh, the Granada here. And then this is a convergence of traffic like it is today, uh, with one-way traffic going up straight, State Street to Sola. Sola's on this side, and uh, Gutierrez is down this way and taking Anapamu and restructuring it so we do away with uh, the parking on each side of Anapamu and we limit the traffic hopefully just to the MTD buses that need to use that and then also for the circulation so that you can drop off in front of the Granada Theater and then we widen the space that's available up here below the steps to the art museum so we can put in Temporary 3D sculpture, artwork, uh, permanent artwork, the trees that Justin just talked about make this arrangement here. Uh, this is that beautiful oak tree uh, at the corner here, at the Lockwood de Forest corner. Uh, we maintain that. And then here we stretch it out so that we have eyes on the library plaza. Uh, and an idea for a little uh, stand-up uh, coffee place or some uh, seating, public seating that's available, furnished by the city. Uh, and then uh, in some locations, we'd have a, a little uh, kiosk element for information and other activities. But that's just a quick spin at some ideas of what things might look like. Uh, and who do we go to next? I'll take it. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. you. Go. Um, so realizing the importance that Paseo's uh, play is a series of links that span or potentially could span um, our downtown area and create um, such a unique sense of place that we have, um, that most, almost nowhere else has. Um, they lend themselves to be the, the gems that any like cohesive design could really lean on to be. Um, a leading role instead of a supporting role as they are today in which they just kind of s abruptly stop at the State Street Corridor. Um, 
And so this slide, is long, along with the next two slides, they begin to offer a rough relationship or a general relationship of how um, the entrances or the, or the exits, I suppose, of the Paseos interact with State Street um, and impose themselves on State Street. Um, and uh, so th these are not site specific. And um, so therefore, they're, they're meant to be pulled and placed anywhere along State Street that they're applicable. So this particular example, um, of course, State Street runs across the page. And then uh, two Paseos inter interacting with it. Um, and these two Paseos, this situation would be where Paseos are uh, farther apart. And the overarching concept is that the Paseo really spills out onto, onto the corridor, um, taking up space, imposing itself. Um, and, and each Paseo would impose itself positively on the State Street corridor separately. Um, and um, some of those. Some of the benefits of this is that it, it offers itself um, to more gently meander this 20 foot, you know, or any transportation lane that's um, where this could happen. Um, that can meander a little bit more um, and therefore give a little bit more meaning to how wide the sidewalks or the pedestrian areas are on both sides. And for the pedestrian, it offers a, a moment of pause and a moment of discovery. Um, as you land in these potentially more activated areas from the adjacent passive, passive spaces. Um, and in addition, of course, it um, gives a backbone for much more interesting uh, landscape features, whether it's just a decorative historic paving that's coming through um, or placement of trees around it or um, landscape area or no, no planting area, all of which help to inform um, whether it's that passive space or the more the activated space. And then the next, uh, the next example, similar to the first one, two Paseos um, interacting with State Street. However, these are far closer together. Um, so close, in fact, that while not lining up, the space between them becomes unified and um, activated collectively. Um, they would still have an impact on, on the space on the 20 foot um, or wider corridor that happens between them, but it really encompasses all of it um, in any form of design feature, whether it's paving or, um, or, or any landscape features. Um, and so this would probably happen mid block, and it gives the opportunity to really liven up the mid block and pull from the intersections. Um, and so the next slide. A little bit different um, State Streets at the bottom. This is where we intersect with uh, a potential, or we interact with a potential intersecting street um, from State Street. Um, and so there's potentially multiple Paseos, but if there's you know two predominant Paseos that seem to want to link up um, in a pedestrian sense right now, but can't potentially the same concepts would apply in which the Paseo would spill out onto the, the sidewalk or corridor, um, take up more space. And if we're, if we're really trying to give uh, prominence and priority to pedestrians, um, potentially squeeze in on, on traffic areas, possibly taking up park, uh, temporary parking lanes, um, all in an effort to overlap these, these spill outs and create a narrower, uh, crosswalk, both to signify to cars that they may be more of a guest in this space and that pedestrians get a priority, um, as well as just making it incredibly or much easier for pedestrians to traverse the Paseo system instead of having to go down, down state and over and across. Uh, so these three examples give, um, they begin to introduce the Paseos um, onto State Street and then we can um, dive further into, into what is a Paseo with um, the next.
Um, hopefully I'm hooked up and you can hear. Um, you know, I, I think the, the analogy of a stream or a river to State Street is not a bad one. <clears throat> what makes a river and a stream interesting are the changes that you see as you, as you progress. Um, parts are calm and, and still, parts are ripples, parts are rapids, you've got waterfalls, you've got eddies, you have a lot of interruptions. And I think a lot of what we're talking about in terms of these ideas is perhaps the idea of interrupting what is too monotonously continuous and linear about State Street. Um, and Justin was just talking about paseo. What is a paseo? Uh, in Spanish, it's a walk, a leisurely stroll. And here, more locally in Santa Barbara, um, I think it's, it's a unique detour from State Street that takes you in, that provides a little respite and change. Um, some shade, tranquility. Um, it's really been celebrated uh, as part of Santa Barbara. Um, Santa Barbara is romantic chaos within a rational city grid. It really is a city grid. But the paseos are something that interrupt that. Um, they also allow for smaller shops, restaurants with a quieter atmosphere, courtyards, and opportunities in the end, perhaps for better housing and offices above the retail activity below. It's not a new idea. Other places across the country, uh, in many developments that are pedestrian friendly uh, and transit orient, I think are using paseos or the idea of a paseo. And currently, we, we sort of looked at three different categories of paseo. We looked at the strong paseo, paseos, the ones that we thought had, had uh, wonderful potential. And, and this, this, these are hopefully familiar to you. Uh, this is the street in Spain, which is actually a, a, an offshoot from El Paseo Viejo here uh, and here. Uh, this is the uh, paseo that cuts through to the, to the courtyard at San Marcos. This is La Arcada. Um, and there's a fair amount of activity, uh, not sadly today in El Paseo Viejo. This picture I took, I think, about 40, 45 years ago. And you can see what a wonderful environment this used to be. Um, and still is. Architecturally, it's got all the ingredients there. Let's see. I'm not sure we can advance this. Can the you arrow? Is that here? Yeah. Doesn't seem to be moving. Oh, it needs to be pointed. OK. <coughs> um, so those were examples of what we felt were strong ideas for Paseo. I think there was a weak Paseo. Sorry. Just go, mm -hmm. back, just go back one. There we go. Oh, OK. Thanks, John. Um, we also looked at areas of, of uh, potential paseos that were, were weak and could be strengthened. Um, they're generally alongside um, parking areas. They are full sometimes of uh, you know, trash areas and things like that. Obviously not very appealing. Very little landscape. Um, these are not great experiences. They're dead end. They have a sort of alley feel, which is the opposite of a, a charming landscape paseo. Um, potential paseos, uh, which we could have, were also something we looked at. Um, a lot of these will depend on real estate opportunities, but you can see here um, that where in the block here we have a, uh, a large parking lot, if you were to introduce two or three 
smaller buildings into this footprint, you could and 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 sort of created a connection through from State Street, and you already have these other potential connections from side streets, you can create a nice little courtyard in the middle. So the opportunity to create paseos is certainly there um, and may wait, may have to wait for real estate opportunities to come our way, but they're clearly here as part of it. And I'm gonna let John take you through the, the three sections of um, the city that oh, we looked at. We oh, also have this is yeah. one thing. This map, um, in this map, the blue are, are sort of active paseos. You see? So we're not really taking full advantage. This is State Street here. The, the yellow represent opportunities, but they're now very weak paseos. And then if you see the red dots, these are opportunities to kind of break through and make connections and create, again, a detour from the State Street experience, which I think also feeds on and um, feeds uh, life into State Street as well by giving interruptions to it. Great. So uh, much like Justin and Mark explained how the Paseo is an integral and intrinsic part of what makes Santa Barbara so unique, we looked at various blocks. And the goal in these block studies was to look at typical challenges and conditions and show different ways of handling it and what were the opportunities. So here's one place on a 500 block. This block, like he explained earlier, has city surface parking, which allows for strong transformation and creation of paseos, as well as an internal plaza, shown here. Wayfinding. Well, these are wayfinding, a professional term for elements that help you make your way through the city. Uh, the wayfinding concept is used where paseos meet the streets to see into the middle of the block. And uh, in this example, there's an iron lantern with a plinth, uh, iron pl with a tile plinth base. This might vary per block with a design competition opportunity for actual wayfinding elements, so like this. Also, also reassures pedestrians that it's safe to go in here. So now we'll go to the, well, these are some more vignettes. So now we'll talk about the 900 block. This shows the need for, or the need for two potential paseos around here. Um, this will provide a, well, I should say, hold on. Uh, two potential paseos to be actualized connecting through to State Street and to Carrillo. This could be a through a retail building and creating this space here and connecting up to State Street there. But it also, as the vignettes will show, using plantings along parking lots. In the absence of a new building, there could be planting to make, frame your view and make it more desirable to walk there. Against a parking lot, perhaps, to hide the cars and make it more interesting. Many of these solutions can be done with minimal investment and are a great small project for the community engagement, participation, and action to keep the beautification of Santa Barbara going in a positive direction. And lastly, the, the uh, thousand block shows ways of creating a paseo entrance onto State Street by stepping a building facade forward and opening a paseo behind the facade. So places that open up can now capture internal spaces using surface park parking to add buildings, mixed use housing, 
and puts parking underground. Existing parking shown repurposed as a small plaza. Adding decorative features, sculptural fountains to and an axis and give artistic feel to the paseos and plazas. And showing a more formal Mediterranean architectural language that is part of El Pueblo Viejo. With that, I want to pass it back to Anthony. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mark and John. Um, Okay, so with this, I wanted to close um, uh, and make a, f a final, final few notes and comments. Um, one thing I did want to do is also thank uh, Tom Sekula, uh, who <laughs> wasn't mentioned early on, but DMHA as well. Uh, the, the, the previous block study, he and Ching uh, did the, the whole series of, um, and also a whole bunch of the digital work and um, putting this pre whole presentation together and painting everyone's drawings and making them look similar and all that good stuff. Um, Okay, so um, I wanted to thank uh, Tess and uh, Eli as well, and uh, city staff who have been uh, really doing a, a huge amount of effort. Uh, this is a long process. We're not used to it. It's not a normal thing that cities go through regularly. It takes a long time, especially to do a good job. Um, so I, I wanted to comment on how, um, how much I'm impressed with the job that they're doing and to um, keep, on, keep on pushing. Um, and. Uh, but that, I wanted to thank them, but as well, um, it's not actually primarily their responsibility to do this. It's actually all of our responsibility and the community's responsibility to really push forward for great design and for what we um, really want Santa Barbara to be and to get the, this, uh, the problems of today solved. Uh, Sheila Lodge reminds us that Santa Barbara is not a commonplace town. And so, as Pearl Chase, Bernard Hoffman, George Washington Smith, Luda Maria Riggs, um, James and Mary Osborne Craig and so many others have shown us it, it took a village of designers, philanthropists, and active citizens uh, to m really make a great place like Santa Barbara. And a hundred years later, it takes a village of designers, philanthropists, and active citizens to make that great place even greater. My call to all of you is to help complete the dream started over a hundred years ago. Um, and as you see, that elevation uh, was pre-earthquake, and the dream was active and live. And then that sketch just shows what that block could be if it had been built. This was never done. Um, so it's a, a, call, a call to complete the dream, um, while simultaneously addressing the challenges of our day and age, including housing, sustainability, as was mentioned today and talked about, and downtown revitalization in a truly Santa Barbara way. Today, we are standing on the shoulders of giants and going forward. And for the, going, for the future generations, we must be the giants for, their, for them to stand on our shoulders. So with that, thank you. We appreciate um, you um, seeing the presentation. And we, we look forward to hearing any comments and thoughts. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anthony and the group, I, I want to thank you from the SSAC standpoint. You guys continued the historic tradition of civic involvement in making this the place that it is. So thank you so much. And we want to continue working with you to actually finalize the draft plan as we go into the summer. Um, I'm going to just let you all know that after Steph, uh, uh, Tess tells us where we're going right now, we are going to open up public comment again on things that you've heard today, and then we're going to come back to the SSAC for your questions and comments at that point. So Tess, if you want to do public comment, you want to fill out slips and get them up to you. So we are going to transition to public comment right now. So if you would like to make a public comment, on the presentation on agenda item A, um, please fill out one of the blue slips in the back and bring it on up to um, anybody up here and, and we will make sure to get your comment. If you could do that in the next couple minutes so that we can get all public comments in. 
um, and heard, that would be great. We are gonna start off with public comment first in the room and then we'll go online. Um, and the, and um, following public comment, I will then be asking for committee members' feedback. Um, so we've heard a lot today. Um, we you would like go, to You wanna go over that slide? Yes, I would. Um, let, let's pull up the discussion slide, perfect. So um, what we are looking for, um, and we will keep this up after public comment are a number of different, um, really is the SSAC's feedback on the guiding principles that you've talked about in the small groups, feedback on the small working groups. So staff really felt like they were um, extremely helpful in moving us forward as we're getting to a draft um, so that we can keep on a, um, the schedule that I showed. Um, and so staff would like to move forward, but I, I would like to hear from the SSAC as well. Um, if you have any comments on the district naming ideas, you can share those today or you can share those later um, via email or, or through the website. And then really focusing on feedback on the um, architectural drawings and design development that you just saw around um, the Piseos and the plan views and the vignettes. Um, and I have a couple questions here for you really asking, do, do those drawings evoke the, um, the Santa Barbara character um, or your general feedback on the design developments? Um, and then your feedback on any sketches or ideas that you would like the team to consider um, as we move into the draft master plan. Um, and so what, what additional ideas, if there are additional vignettes that you would like to see or additional concepts, um, the team will be working on a full plan view as well, um, but we'd like to hear that from the committee. So that's a lot, I'll just, I'll leave it at that. We're gonna transition to public comment right now and then, um, give the SSAC a minute to think about those questions, um, and then we'll, we'll regroup back. Yeah, at, the, at the end of public comment, I might take a five minute break, let people. That sounds great. Yeah. We'll take a five minute break at the end of public comment. So the first public commenter I have is Sharon Rich. And Sharon will be followed by Nicholas Storr and Sullivan Israel. Thank you, everyone. My name is Sharon Rich. I'm president of Friends of State Street, a nonprofit dedicated to building community engagement in the State Street Master Plan. Your presentations today, all of them, truly represent the ongoing collaboration that is transforming the voices of our community into an outline for action. It is a really great step forward. And I thank you all for the hours of work that you have put into this. Almost 100 years ago, in 1925, an earthquake destroyed 85% of downtown Santa Barbara, leaving the city at a crossroads. The community united around a shared vision, and slowly but surely, a world-class destination arose from the rubble, working together. And the rebuilding was transformative. What we know is that when Santa Barbara engages, State Street thrives. And today we're at a crossroads. What we do next matters. Friends of State Street pledges to continue engaging the community in this process. We pledge to collaborate with community stakeholders, businesses, organizations, and surrounding neighborhoods as it evolves now and into the future. And we encourage the people of Santa Barbara to show, again, that when Santa Barbara engages, State Street thrives. And if we get it right, our most famous street will be a world-class destination for the next 100 years and beyond. Thank you. Hello. Uh, hi, my name is Nick. I'm with Strong Town Santa Barbara. We're a local ag advocacy group. Uh, we support, you know, more housing, better transit, and car-free State Street. You might have noticed our posters that have been going up on windows of shops on State Street. Um, three times now, we've been handing out posters and flyers to businesses on State Street and asking how they feel about keeping it car-free. And you know, the resounding answer from almost everyone has been that they love 
keeping it car free. It's better foot traffic. Uh, drive, there's no parking on state anyway, so people that are driving by can't simply stop and enter their store. Um, people, tourists too, have been going to shops and talking about how nice it is to walk around. Um, and there's more space to just exist outside, eat outside, which is so nice given the climate that we have here. So I'm really heartened by today's presentation. I love that, you know, we're potentially further investing in more spaces for pedestrians. And, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing what's going to go on in the future. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Sullivan Israel. Uh, you've heard my voice multiple times. It's very nice to finally be here in person. Thanks for having this on spring break. I don't know if that was on purpose or not. Um, anyway, so yes, I help uh, run Strong Town Santa Barbara. We have a few people here today, so thanks for coming and mentioning the poster campaign. Uh, what I want to uh, mention today is something that happened to me yesterday. Yesterday I was in Yosemite. Um, I know this sounds very random, but hear me out. So I get to uh, Tunnel View. To where you can see the whole valley. And I asked a couple to take a picture of me and my friend and ask them where they were from. They said Canada. I said, what were you doing? Well, it turns out they were just come from Santa Barbara. Um, and they told me that they had planned on seeing more of Southern California, but they liked Santa Barbara so much that they could not tear themselves away. That's what they told me. And I said, well, what did you do while you were there? I said, well, we rented e-bikes. We biked along the beach. We biked up State Street, went to the Mission. Um, and they said they absolutely loved it. And they spent three nights. Uh, a few hours later, I was climbing up to Yosemite Falls and there were a group of Germans, and I don't speak German, but I heard them say Santa Barbara. <laughs> so, of course, I walk up, and I found myself standing, huffing and puffing, because I'm not exactly an avid hiker, right? Um, overlooking a precipice with Half Dome in the distance, telling them what to do in Santa Barbara, because they were about to visit. Some of them had already visited, and I, and I asked them what they were doing. They said, oh, well, we already downloaded the B-Cycle app. We're going to bike around. I said, that's great. And then another guy comes down the mountain. He said, are you guys talking about Santa Barbara? <laughs> not joking. Uh, <laughs> He's from here, and he says, I love biking on State Street, whatever. So we had a whole conference about State Street, but like on a windy precipice in Yosemite. Uh, my point is, it's a very popular place. Um, also, obviously, I mentioned biking a couple times on purpose, because they all did mention that they biked on State Street. So I think it's important. The drawings today were beautiful, but it's always important to remember how people really use the street. Beauty can, I think, enhance the uses of State Street, but can't really inform them. So it's important that we think about what the uses are and then how beautiful designs and drawings can come to life with those uses in mind. So thank you so much. Hello again, everybody. This is pretty amazing, isn't it? Um, the reason I wanted to speak again is because um, I have been lucky enough to travel or both around the country and around the world. And my sister lives in Chelsea in New York City. The, uh, I've been to the Chelsea market. When the Third Street Promenade first opened, I was there the first month. And I remember coming back and saying, why don't we have something like this in Santa Barbara? That was a great uh, story, by the way, those stories. So um, we also hear those kind of stories, which is really cool. Um, and I did, did whatever, I, I took a right turn there. But I have been also to really high level art, uh, contemporary craft shows. I've been a member of those. Um, and so you can imagine my ears perked up when I heard the marketplace area uh, described, and, and what a great presentation. Um, so th the downside of this great project is the more we create State Street, the more isolated the Sunday show becomes. And I, I just have to remind everybody that we're already isolated, even though it seems like we're not. We actually are. Most of our visitors have found us by accident. So. This is a great opportunity, I think, if we pursue that design idea to incorporate members of the Santa Barbara Arts and Crafts Show to offset the loss of income that we already have and certainly will have. Um, so again, I'd like to open that line of communication. And um, I, I forgot to mention, I've been an elected member of our advisory committee, which is a city committee, city level. I've been on and off for. 40 years, I now serve as an alternate. 
So just wanted to let you know that that's my position and please let's get started on this. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Jorge Baez. Uh, my, uh, my background is in architecture, permaculture, with a focus on sustainability and also on uh, hospitality and experience uh, curation. Uh, first of all, just appreciate the, the space and the effort on opening these uh, forums for the people to speak up. And uh, uh, um, be grateful for the volunteers um, of architects and designers um, giving their time up. Uh, I want to reiterate uh, the support of the CEC involvement on that. I think as the, the organization and the cradle of the Earth Day in Santa Barbara, that should be a big uh, component on that. Um, and as uh, also in my free time, I just like to uh, research and um, just travel and look into other solutions that other places in the world have um, um, used as an approach. And uh, uh, given that uh, looking to be more pedestrian on, the, um, on State Street, the possibility of uh, raising the level of the sidewalk and uh, either or incorporate or not the um, a possibility of bicycles, uh, but that I've seen uh, in the Europe, in the Netherlands, uh, Canada, and some places in South America, just raising the sidewalk uh, to the whole level, creating a big plaza that uh, gives a big aspect of a pedestrian um, primordial space. And uh, even in the intersections, that which means that the car would have to stop to then rise up and then uh, slow their uh, speeds to then come down and follow their, um, their paths. And that would be one of the um, things that pop up in, in, my, in my mind. Also, um, the possibility of um, using hemp as a building material, uh, being California cannabis-based, fire-resistant, um, thermoacoustic insulation, and newly uh, being legal after 2018 Farm Bill. Uh, so there's a big opportunity to showcase that material as a possibility for sustainability uh, in this city. Uh, thank you so much. I just wanted to comment on one of the things I love about Santa Barbara is our bus system. I can get everywhere uh, from downtown. I live downtown and I take classes at UCSB, I can get out there, I can go to Goleta, I can go everywhere. I would like to see that continue to be incorporated in any kind of plan that is um, implemented. In that regard, I think one comment I would make is I didn't see uh, any kind of effort to incorporate the funk zone in this plan. And I think that it, if we look at Santa Barbara and the appeal of Santa Barbara, the funk zone is part of that. And I would like to see uh, what I think is missing right now is the trolley system, which we had for a while, was really very helpful to be on, sa on State Street and hop on the trolley, get from the funk zone to all the way up to um, the Arlington, and I would like to see that reincorporated in, a, in any kind of plan that's um, proposed. Thank you. Hello, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, I feel a lot of positive uh, vibes in the room, and I'd just like to point out the fact that, um, and acknowledge the volunteer efforts that are being made by many local Santa Barbara architects. Um, first, in the um, multiple state, uh, the state Street charrettes that we had back in 2017 and 2020 that involved many, many of the architect members of our local AIA and then the current architect efforts um, that you guys put together over the last couple of months. Um, I, I feel a little bad to point out, uh, but feel it's important to suggest that the local architects get it. We get Santa Barbara, and you're seeing really good results from these volunteer efforts. And perhaps the city should rethink their inclination to hire out of town 
consultants who produce some material that isn't as well received in the community and really think about how we as a community can work more closely together between city staff and local architects to figure out the planning challenges of our community, architectural visioning for the future of our community, and to see the effectiveness of what that brings uh, to the conversation. Secondly, I'd like to just also commend the fact that we are now having a much broader discussion, which I think is also yielding a lot of positive feelings about what was discussed today. And I think that's that we're looking at properties adjacent to State Street, not just the public right of way, but the role that the adjacent privately owned properties play in the success of downtown. There were discussions and some slides that spoke to the economic vitality of housing construction downtown, uh, adaptive reuse of existing buildings, inclusion of housing and mixed use neighborhood vision for our downtown. This was absent from the earlier versions of this State Street discussion and I think the richness that has been brought to the conversation by including considerations of how properties and zoning affects what we can do downtown is a really positive development in this conversation. Thank you. Hi, I'd like to just say to the architects, I really liked your They're of people with walkers and wheelchairs. Thank you. We do have four speakers with raised hands online. Lori and Davy, Lee Heller, Anna Marie Gott, Alex Grady. Davy, I'll unmute you and you'll be able to speak. Hi. I I really appreciated and enjoyed the uh, presentation um, by the architects, um, especially about the paseos, the idea of paseos. Um, and I, I didn't, um, I still don't quite uh, understand how they can be um, put in where they're not there already. But I, I'm very glad that they, they can be. I like that idea a lot, and especially um, the hints. I, I'm not sure they were saying this, but I thought they were saying that the uh, some of those uh, parking lots could be turned into paseos and courtyards. And I think that would be just wonderful um, if that could be done. Um, I, I don't understand how the parking could be put underground, but it seems like um, to some extent uh, the existing parking garages are um, sometimes underutilized and that people who use the parking lots um, could uh, could instead use the parking garages. Um, so I just wanted to express my appreciation for that uh, revelation about the paseos and the courtyards and getting rid of some of the parking lots. And um, also I wanted to just say about the um, landscaping for the the design um, that I hope that uh, palm trees will the use of palm trees will be minimized because they don't really offer shade. Um, I know they're kind of iconic to Southern California, but I think it would be better to use real shade trees. Thank you. The next speaker is Lee Heller. Lee Heller, I'll unmute you and you'll be able to speak. Go ahead, Lee. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair Davis and members of the commission. I wanna thank all of you for all the hard work you have been doing 
and the hard work of the team of architects that put so much time and effort into this. I agree with pretty much everything that was said. I'm a particularly strong proponent of a pedestrian and bicycle promenade, of a strong town's perspective on developing a 15-minute city, on the ecological revitalization presented under the CEC umbrella. Um, my question is this. Hello? Are you muted me? Am I unmuted again? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dave. Didn't hear you. We heard you say your question is this, and then um, we did not hear the question. Thank you for the transition. My question is this: How do we pay for it? So this, I feel like we're still at the thirty thousand foot level, or we've now even jumped up to the hundred thousand foot level in the conceptualization of all these new paseos of splitting buildings, of burying parking lots. It's not that I don't agree. But we have to come back to reality and think about what's affordable and what's affordable within reasonable lifetimes. And so I'm hoping that somehow from the amazing ideas that were presented today, the committee members can extract the more practical elements that we can start to imagine in a design that can be implemented, at least within my lifetime, and I'm 63. So again, I approve of everything conceptually, but I think it's time for us to get past 100,000 level thinking and down into the real world where we can start to make things happen. Thank you so much. The next two speakers are Alex Gravener and Anna Marie Gott. Alex Gravener, I'll unmute you. Go ahead and speak, Alex. Hi, yeah, so I think generally um, the direction that the committee is going is really nice. Um, I think that uh, one emphasis that um, is somewhat missing here is that um, this is really a downtown um, and housing is probably going to be the primary focus going forward. Um, more than just an experience that people will come and experience, um, State Street is a lifestyle. And so um, I think that having stunning views and everything is really great, but we should also pay a lot of attention to uh, when people come down from their second, third story apartment onto the street level, what their life is gonna be like. Um, there was a, a a picture that was shown of uh, a fruit market in front of a building in Europe. Um, the funny thing about that was uh, in the background, you could see you know, four story, five story buildings, um, something that we would hope to have on state, but we don't have right now. And um, that's where the people come, they go walk down to the fruit stand. Um, and that is kind of the lifestyle that is part of all of this. Um, so kind of keeping that in mind would be good. Um, also, on the Paseos, I think trying to keep practical uh, matters in mind would be important. It's great that in the future we could rebuild some buildings with new Paseos, but trying to keep um, in mind what is practical and doable in the near future would be great. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for, say, the Housing Authority to redevelop parking lots into, you know, dense housing downtown and build some of the Paseos into that. We've got a lot of side streets. Um, generally. The nice thing about these paseos is it really makes the downtown more of a downtown area instead of just a line. And there's a lot of side streets that connect to State Street that we could close and make part of the vision as well. Anyways, thank you so much. The last speaker is Anna Marie Gott. Anna Marie Gott, you may speak. Good evening, committee members. I'm really glad that we are paying attention um, to the landscape along State Street. That said, I don't want anyone to forget how important seating is. The past State Street design included benches that were strategically placed in the public right of way. Today, our State Street benches have been removed and there is nowhere to sit unless you are dining somewhere or you find a windowsill with a ledge. So I really don't want to see um, seating provided um, in this design only to be taken away in the future. So I hope there's a solid plan moving forward for permanent seating. Policy 3.1 of the pedestrian master plan states that the city shall pro protect, preserve, and enhance the Paseo net network. This is not happening. Not only has the planning and the public works department failed to protect some of our existing paseos, they have eliminated the, 
eliminated the possibility of expanding the Paseo network by supporting developments that prevent the expansion of the Paseo uh, network. In one case, the Paseo off of West Figueroa from one parking, um, one of the city's parking lots to Figueroa was first destroyed by the Public Works Department when they allowed an unapproved utility box to be installed in the middle of the Paseo. Then the Paseo was closed for private use by the planning department. Uh, that is just ridiculous to have, have, have happened. And if we are going to have a pedestrian master plan that states that the city shall protect, preserve, and enhance the Paseo network, then someone needs to tell the public works and the planning department that they cannot install utility boxes in the middle of them or shut them um, out from, from the public's um, ability to actually use them. So thank you very much. Put back up the slide, the SSAC discussion. Yes. Oh, you already did. Good. You're ahead of me. Uh, we're going to take a five minute break, and I mean five minutes. I will start when we come back. For SSAC members, I want you to focus on these questions which you have there. I'm going to ask for your comments. I'm going to start by just opening it up for discussion. I'm not going to go around the room as we've done in the past. So it'll basically be upon you to raise your hand, to me recognize you, and we'll go from there. Five minute break. We'll be back here at 611. Thank you.
Y'all want to uh, keep kibitzing out there and, and uh, networking? It's working. I like it. I like all the discussions going on. Hey, Diane, you and I can carry on and we'll get it done. <laughs> okay, SSAC members, let's get back to the table, please. Good energy in the room, though. I like that. Okay, I'm missing a few of my compatriots, but I'm going to open up and, and, get, and get going. Okay, uh, I can't see it very brightly. I don't know what's happening up there. Timmy, you can help with that as all. There you go. Okay, I'm coming back to the committee for questions and comments and keep your focus on what, we're, what we got going on up there. Staff wants feedback on from the guiding principles, core strategies, how the small groups work, district naming ideas. I really like the idea of going out to the public. Tess, I really like going out to the public uh, with the naming ideas and getting that input, both you know, Newshawk independent and online to create state. I like that. Feedback in the drawings that you saw. Uh, and uh, I am going to open it up. Who wants to go first? And just before we jump in, I'm gonna, so I'm going to have the, um, the architect group come up to the front, and I will be up as well, or, or on the side, so we're all here available if you have questions, um, obviously in addition to the feedback. Got it. Michael, you're on. <coughs> all right. Thank you. Um, two quick ones. First on naming. Um, I think for planning purposes, we've had names that we've been working with, and I support that. However, at the end of the day, do we need signs that tell people where they are? Um, hopefully, it's the feel of the place that, that lets people know where they are rather than a sign telling them where they are. So I think the names should be pl for planning purposes, and whenever the plan is implemented, we don't need signs telling people where they are. Um, they should come to their own conclusions based on what's around them. And uh, second on, uh, I know it's, I stuck to it, but my boss shared a, a map, uh, a census density map of population in the U.S. If you zoom to Santa Barbara, it was real interesting, and take the, the boundaries of El Pueblo Viejo, it's essentially the least populated part of the entire city. Um, and I think if a healthy downtown should be the most populated part of a city. Um, so I think, uh, I, I don't know how much El Pueblo Viejo is part of that or if it's um, something else that, result, that caused that to result, but I think that needs to change. And hopefully, I, I did hear from the architects that um, to respond to this, the needs of the city and the, the residents of the city and that housing is part of it, that a healthy downtown should be the, the most densely populated part and not the least densely populated part. Thank you. Who else has a comment? Kristen. Thank you. Um, this is incredible to me. This is it. This is home run. This is to me what I've been waiting for to see. Um, this whole idea of a master plan and from my perspective was catalyzed from the AIA charrettes and all the important 
um, local work by our local architects who had vision, and um, those charrettes were beautifully done and then sat on a shelf, and then done again and then sat on a shelf. And to me, this is incorporating in some of those elements that have been waiting past these charrettes to be integrated in and to let us see how it works. And, and um, you know, especially the idea of the paseos and how to develop paseos. So um, with the question of where's the money going to come from, this I love the idea of it being a framework. This is not something that the city is going to build paseos. This is a framework for how you would infill to allow and, and um, promote paseos and really re-revitalize them. So um, to me, just I just congratulations. I, I don't know where it goes after this, but I just, this to me was the moment where I saw what it was that I've been really hoping to see this whole time. Um, so I'll just go through my list. Um, loved working in the small groups. I think um, it was really responsive to this committee that we all wanted to, to get in there and give more input and give more detail and the small groups was a way to be able to go line by line and really um, get into the nitty gritty. So I personally really appreciated those and I thought they benefited the work that came back here. You can see it in here that input was already being integrated in. Um, I love the ecological framework and also very responsive that you're already incorporating it into one of the four pillars and, and talking about how it could work. And again, you know, it might be the work of the city to adopt the ecological framework and then apply it as this is being developed. Um, but just uh, thank you to CEC for really um, highlighting those important points of that and then presenting to the public so that then by the time you presented it, here, it has already been sort of supported through the community, and um, it's really what we're already doing, but um, to really enumerate the, those pillars to be incorporated in, I love that. Um, I loved seeing the meanders in the roads and the description that, that gives a reason for why some of the sidewalks might be widened in some place and narrowed, and it gives a little bit of whimsy and um, a, sort of differentiation through and and again I understand we're not adopting a plan today but I'm just highlighting the elements that I really enjoyed seeing I loved the vignettes for ideas of what could be here or there not a you know it's not set this will be this paseo with lamp posts but this is an idea of how a paseo could be celebrated um, I, it was just that little image in there for just a minute, but I loved seeing in the midline of the street, the trolley. Um, I just, I, I would love to see a railed trolley that goes all the way up and down, back and forth. Um, and it was just in one of the drawings there, and I, I really um, want to grab onto that. Uh, let's see. I. Um, really, really love the concept of establishing the framework or the guide plan for what could happen. And you know, we've been so focused on State Street, State Street, that it was really kind of opening up a relief to be able to look at how it integrates in. And you know, long before this master plan started, it was, you know, Anthony always talking about, well, how are you going to integrate in Library Plaza, Delaguerra Plaza? And there were those little hints of that in the concept drawings, and I could really see it for the first time of, of, of not just patchwork, but how these could be integrated together. So um, I really appreciated seeing Delaguerra Plaza and Library Plaza. Um, things I would like to see more um, is more trees, more canopy, um, more passive seating um, options. Um, it's one of the things that I think uh, we need more is not just seating where you're paying to be at an establishment, but more of like a park environment that there's passive seating where you could go and, and not necessarily be shopping or spending money, even though I understand the economic vitality aspect of it, I think it's also all of our downtown and, and backyard. Um, so that idea of a mosaic that was mentioned of paseos, green spaces, and, and um, passageways. Um, I would like to see ideas for celebrating our local Chumash culture and history. Um, we, we talk a lot about El Pueblo Viejo and the Mediterranean and the landscaping, and um, one very specific, but I think it would really be um, 
a great opportunity to really incorporate that in. We're doing that in Delaguerre Plaza, and I think it, we can't keep going with the master plan without really thoughtfully, intentionally incorporating that in. Um, I would like to see at least one purely pedestrian block. Um, maybe it's the 700 block, but just even what it would look like. So all of the drawings we had did have a roadway through the middle, um, but I just think it would be great to visually see what that might might look like. Um, I'd like to see an integrated bus plan, trolley plan, all the way from the waterfront, Amtrak station, and in. So maybe maybe a trolley doesn't go all the way, and I won't say what I think it should be or not be, but it we, we've talked around the edges of it, of, of having that integrated in, and we've had public speakers before talking about how you need to be able to get to the Amtrak station or the waterfront. Um, I'm just assuming that we as a city are prioritizing housing downtown. It's been a huge part of our housing element, a huge part of uh, discussion. So um, I think it's inherent in this planning that we're going to have and are really prioritizing and incentivizing housing downtown. Um, but then how do we make it so that it's welcoming and the, the framework and the um, utilities and all of that is set up to, to accept that um, hopefully thousands of new units downtown. And so um, really love the landscaping, um, the market concept of, of the marketplaces and those, the umbrellas, and really the, just the livability of downtown. And um, just well done, that would be my feedback, thank you. Good, thank you. Next, somebody raise their hand over here. Yeah. Hillary. Staff and all the volunteers who did all this work. Um, uh, I'm gonna jump around on these. Um, one, I, I love the characterization of the Paseos. I think it's kind of the most interesting and special and unique thing about our downtown, um, that we have porous um, blocks. Uh, and so making those even more welcoming and inviting and interesting, uh, I think is doable. And especially if you think about, you know, what's it gonna cost, how are you gonna do it? It's like, you don't have to do them all in the same year at the same time, even just um, a few at a time can really enhance different parts of downtown. Um, as far as the names go, I'm not super tied to any of them um, other than like arts district makes more sense. cultural, like that doesn't actually meet anything with regards to place, I would say. So arts district makes sense, city or civic. I would just say whatever you do, uh, I think they should translate well into Spanish um, and make make sense the same way. Obviously, if you call one old town, the whole place is already called El Pueblo Viejo. So um, that sort of makes sense to me. So um, that's that piece. Um, one thing I want to mention is, uh, this is sort of an announcement in the sense that it's been brought up in public comment and, and other people have brought it up just so you know, um, starting May 31st of this year, uh, MTD is bringing back in a temporary fashion and a very reduced uh, level of service, a downtown waterfront shuttle circulator that'll go up Chapala, over at Sola, down Anacapa, and then to stay at Gutierrez, serve Amtrak station, and then head down to Cabrillo, to the harbor, to the zoo, and then back to state um, and back to Chapala. It'll be Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Unfortunately, that's kind of what we have the, the one-time grant funding to do, but it's something. It will connect the Arts and Crafts Show again to downtown, which is great, um, and uh, it'll be about every 20 minutes from 10 to 6 on those days. Um, so look forward to that. It's a temporary thing, again, just through Labor Day, um, but it'll, you know, um, be happening in this new context that we have downtown since it's been several years since it ran. So, looking forward to seeing what that what that does for the community um, and what kind of partnerships can come out of that. Um, I appreciated the small groups as well. I have to say, though, um, one thing that. Uh, is disappointing and sort of worrisome is that what we were given in the mobility utility group um, before our small group mentioned very robustly safety and vision zero, um, which is a policy of the city of Santa Barbara 
not just an idea, um, has to do with safety and eliminating fatalities and serious uh, collisions throughout the city. So um, that was in the language, the guiding principle um, about that section, and now it's gone. And I know someone in our group thought it should be removed and then it was removed. And that's just really concerning to me um, because the thing that people talk about the most in this plan, in the public comment and all of that, has been safety. So e-bike panic and all those things, right? Which is, is well-founded. If we remove vision zero from our vision for this plan or any other part of the city, I think that's a huge, huge problem. So. Um, I think it has to go back in. It just really has to. Um, or, I don't know. I, I just think it's, it's a really good guiding principle. It's done a lot of great things in our city already. If you look at all the, the projects that are being built right now, the active transportation projects, they are all vision zero projects. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the, the main flaw I see with, with what's um, been brought to us today. Um, but all the other pieces, I think, look good, obviously, the devil's in the details, and the implementing strategies are gonna be um, interesting and argued over and all that stuff, but um, I think we're starting to distill these things down into a good vision and, and strategies uh, generally. Um, so we're getting there, we're getting headed in the right direction um, and look forward to seeing how it um, refines further. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, there you go. I was just confirming with Timmy. Um, so we, we um, it may not have been in the slide today, but we do have a, a Vision Zero component still in that, that portion. So that group will, in particular, will look at that again. Um, anyway, uh, we can certainly chat more, but that, that is something that I recognize does need to be in the plan. I think the whole team does recognize that. So I wanna just assure everybody um, on the committee that that will be in, in the plan. Okay, who's next? Megan. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair Davis. Um, oh, awesome. Thank you. Um, I think I can be relatively brief because I'm going to echo the comments for the most part that have already been articulated. From a 50,000 foot perspective, I think this is absolutely beautiful. I mean, it, it is much more reflective, I think, of um, what a lot of us expected to see. It has that sort of visionary element, it's really beautiful, it's really exciting, it um, prioritizes the things, paseos, as have been mentioned by everyone, that we all love so much. So I, on sort of all of these questions, I, I think it's great. I think it's fantastic. I will say, though, I continue to have um, confusion, I guess, is the right word, about where we are going, where this is going. And, and what I mean by that is, there are still some really big questions about State Street. Are we going to have cars? Are we not going to have cars? What blocks are going to be involved in this plan? Are there going to be bikes or no bikes? And I do understand that this is a framework, but I don't quite understand how we can accept a framework that's predicated on um, some really unresolved questions. And so for me, I, you know, I, I have very strong views on those questions, so I kind of know, for me personally, what this means, but I wonder if we all have that same vision, and I think the answer is almost certainly no. And so while I, I love it, and the work that's been done is, I, I mean, in, truly incredible, but I don't, I don't quite see how we get from this work to a place where we can recommend to the city council an actual master plan that is implementable in any meaningful way. And so. That continues to be my concern, and I, I will continue to articulate that I really believe that it is in this committee's best interest to take a vote on these questions so that we can move forward in a way that has some clarity. And, you know, I may not get what I want out of that vote, but that's democracy, you know? And I, I think if we can do that, then we can all be speaking from the same set of facts. And I, I guess I would just say I continue I love this, but I don't know that my love of it is the same as Kristen's love or is the same as Hillary's. Like, we don't know 
the foundation from which we are expressing our excitement. Um, so with all that said, it's, it is awesome. It's super exciting. And I hope that we can answer some of these key questions so that we can go out and, and really like, sell this to the community in a way that's reflective of what we all anticipate the reality will actually be. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Ed. Thank you. It's, um, I, I share some of Megan's concerns. Uh, I look at the at this timeline and you know we only may be meeting one or two more times and we're going to take a vote to send a city council. I mean, I, I don't know. You know, just, just let me comment cause on Megan's point and your point. Because like, Ken and I have been working with staff, right? We're going to be actually working on implementing strategies and making those decisions and coming to the small groups and doing internally discussions and votes on that, mm -hmm. leading into our next meeting where we'll have to officially direct staff to, to let the, go out to the public. So we're, we're heading there, Ed. Okay. My, my concern is that also along those same lines is there is not enough um, discussion with the Landmarks Commission and the Planning Commission on what's being proposed. Uh, when I look at the schedule here, I mean, we may not be going to landmarks until I don't know when. It's, it's way out there. And Planning Commission, if you're going to, if you're going to uh, remove cars from State Street, they gotta, get, they gotta deal with, at some point in time, with the, uh, uh, the transportation master plan. Uh, if you're going to uh, you know, put housing downtown, you know, there's a lot of things Planning Commission's gotta do. I'm not so much concerned about the architecture, the three-dimensional architecture that land, landmarks will be seeing because that will be brought to us as something happens. I am concerned with the, with the plan that runs those 13 blocks. And we saw only three blocks tonight. I believe that there's probably all 13 blocks drawn someplace. So we saw three blocks on three, on three screens and we saw 20-some screens of, of uh, Paseo work. And for some reason, we got it backwards. And I think that we really need to, well, number one, deal with mobility. Are we going to have some kind of transportation up and down State Street? That's got to be a question that's asked and answered. And the plan that we come up with is going to have the answer on it, or has to have the answer on it. And so I'm saying, we really got to get to landmarks. We've got to get to planning commission. We, we need those, those decision makers to tell staff and the State Street Advisory Committee that yeah, we like this or we don't like it, and here's why we don't like it. Um, I was mentioning to Anthony uh, during the break that we've got a plan which is bifurcated. It's broken up and it, and it doesn't tell us the whole story. And then we've got landscape designs for, for where, where a paseo might come into the, into the State Street and they aren't integrated with the drawings that we've got. Uh, you know, the whole thing is, is, seems to be um, uncoordinated, uncollected, and yet we're going to make a recommendation in December of 2024. Um, that's not more than six, seven months away and two or three meetings, and, and we're expected to make a recommendation to city council that they have told in public many times we're going to rely on State Street Advisory Committee's recommendations to us. It's a tough responsibility to have, but they have said they want that information from us. So we've got to find a way to get to landmarks, get to planning commission many times. As much as you don't like doing it, we've got to get there many times and comment on this stuff. Otherwise, you're going to find that landmarks commission on, in October is going to say, well, I don't know that we can buy into this. And they have the right to do that under the charter. And we got to deal with this. Um, a lot I like about the plan, the site plan. That's, that's what we're talking about. When, when we talked about set, uh, making the, uh, the, gr the graphics or whatever, the, the project look like Santa Barbara, I think what we were talking about is the plan we see. Not the buildings. The buildings are going to be taken care of or they'll be themselves. We gotta, we gotta concentrate on this plan. We gotta make sure we got the plan right, that the plan works from 
Solar Street, all the way down to the freeway. You know, we, we've got a planting plan right now of palm trees that march down from Mission Street all the way to solar or whatever. Are we abandoning that? That's not what Landmarks recommended when, you came, when, when State Street Advisory came to us about a, a month or two ago. That was not the recommendation. Yet, the landscape plan we see today seems to disregard that. Yeah, there's a lot of other reasons why it could, you know, shade and whatever. We've got to work through that. Uh, Suzanne, then I'll go to Diane. Suzanne. Um, yeah, this is Suzanne, this is Suzanne um, I, um, I do appreciate all the work our um, volunteer architects have done, and it's great to have the vision and the, the ideas, but I do, I do feel that we're back to where we were two years ago in terms of the discussion and what we're talking about, and we keep talking about the same thing again. And we're actually talking around the main topic, which is State Street. And we need to make, we need to, I mean, yes, I like the broader view looking at the Paseos. The Paseo um, study is one implementation action of the whole plan, there's other things. Um, if you look in the report, um, that needs to be considered like open, you know, creating meeting spaces. What basically there's a lot of questions that need to be answered: circulation, stormwater management, um, on the State Street plan itself. Um, so, in moving forward, I think that we can, the group can continue to look at specific way decisions need to be made about. I'm just supporting what Ed was saying, that further development needs to be studied of the street itself and the plans and what we're actually looking at in terms of, is this gonna be pedestrian? Is this gonna have bikes? Is this gonna have cars? Is this gonna have a tr trolley or a tram? We still don't know. Thank you, Diane. So, so I want to start out positive and say um, I thought the 400 block treatment was really great and I've been talking about that for a long time and um, you know it's probably as good as we're gonna get um, I think the Paseo ideas were interesting um, and I think the drawings were were really um, much nicer than what we've seen in in previous versions and I think this meeting has been a lot more positive, so I really appreciate that um, we're coming from a positive place. I agree with Megan and others who have said, you know, we're sort of skirting some of the major issues, and um, I'm not quite sure how we're gonna get there. Um, I do think that the working group um, setting is a good way for us to have pretty frank conversations about issues. Um, we had one in our working group that I wouldn't have wanted to have in this room, but I think it was good to have. Um, and and the, I think we need more of them. We need more working group meetings. We can't just do it in one meeting and then expect that staff has absorbed everything that we said and you know, it's, it's an iterative process. I also think it's iterative between the working groups. And so, you know, each of these concepts don't stand on their own and they feed into each other. And so somehow we need to figure out how to share and comment on what other working groups are doing as well. Um, and I'm not quite sure how that, that will work. Um, maybe it's a, a big meeting, but if it's a big meeting, it's gotta be before the plan is drafted, you know, and, and ready to go for public review. Um, I think um, we really do need to get down to a block by block plan view. I agree with you, Ed. I think those plans are probably out there and it would have been nice to see more of that um, work that's been done. And then I think, you know, the big issue out there and one of the issues that's really important to, to me and to the League of Women Voters is housing. And, you know, it's not just magically gonna happen. So we need some real strategies about how we're gonna get housing and affordable housing. And I'd love to start identifying sites in the downtown core that are publicly owned that we can use for, you know, for public housing, for affordable housing. And so I think 
we need to take that step as well in this plan or I don't think it's going to be complete. I don't Robin. care what the districts are named. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> Robin, go ahead. We have gotten, we've done a lot of good communication with the public to date, and I think that each of the elements, the closer we get, the more of that we see in this plan. And so today I was very um, thankful to see really how the street treatments, the sense of arrival, the placemaking, the tree scale, um, the meaningful, thoughtful sense of discovery can create a vibrant uh, economic space. And I think this was really the first time that I've been able to see how the human scale of the architecture creates the vision for the future that we all have wanted to see. And I think that's been somewhat the disconnect between what we see out on the street now and the expanse of space that we're trying to navigate and fill and how we can ultimately get there through the diverse landscaping and et cetera. So I was very, very th uh, thankful to see all of that. Um, and I think that the small group settings uh, have been really excellent and particularly around the conversation around how to move towards these big ideas to implementation and digging deeper and deeper into the short, medium, and long-term vision of how we implement all of these great ideas and what we can and can't do in the short and long-term uh, as well as with funding, et cetera. Um, I think what I would like to see is how the visuals and the plan really continue to and really dive deeper into how the um, data can inform this because we can have big beautiful ideas about what we want to see but we want I want to know how that foot traffic is going to support the economic vitality of the downtown and ultimately so that businesses property owners and investors can really understand what to expect as we are continuing with this project um, lastly in regards to the the different naming uh, opportunities for the different spaces. We'd like to throw out um, El Pueblo Centro for uh, the, cent the center area mm -hmm. or just El Centro to honor the same idea. Arts District is being used already and I think the Arts District uh, individuals who are making up that area really support that uh, name as an ongoing working term. And I think that the Entertainment District um, I would say that that one, the verdict is out. We need to explore that more. I think we could really solidify a better um, uplifted name for that area. Thank you. Good, thanks, Ron. Peter. So um, I, I think this was a really good meeting and, and um, I, I th wanna thank Anthony and, and the group for all their efforts. <coughs> Excuse me. I, um, I must admit that um, I think we still, what happens when you get artistic drawings is you get inspired. Uh, but we gotta get real. And part of getting real is what several people have pointed out. Um, we have to answer some fundamental questions. Let's get those resolved. The art, I am convinced, will come readily with all the talent that is in this town and the talent that sits on our board to get to the appropriate uh, final project and the aesthetic. To me, that is actually the easy part. The hard part is making really tough decisions on the infrastructure, any code or ordinance changes we're gonna to do to incentivize housing instead of acting like we want housing and doing nothing about it. And the great thing about the current Paseo Nuevo right now is it's gonna require city leaders to really get into and understand the fundamentals of why our current housing, as Michael pointed out, doesn't exist downtown. Robin and, and Kristen and I are involved in the the, and, and some council members on trying to form a seabed. And one of the more shocking things, even to me, that does development 
was 5% of our structures downtown have housing. 5% folks. It's basically we have a dead zone. So we need to get real about how do we change that. And it feels very tang you know, like, well, just kind of around the surface. We actually aren't grappling with the real fundamental changes required of this com committee to actually provoke changes. The Paseos are great. They're wonderful. They're romantic. But why, I mean, that idea's been around for 100 years, and there hasn't been much change in the last 100 years. Well, it's because it's hard to do. You got to get private people, public people involved. One of the ways, if you want Paseos, highly incentivize developments with Paseos. I mean, make it easy for the people to in incorporate them. Um, so this is all part of what I think we need to g do. I thought the small groups were awesome because discussions were frank. And you know, there's nothing wrong with frankness. It's really healthy. And it makes people understand each other's positions. Um, and inform, right? I mean, that's what we're trying to get. So I thought those were great, encourage them. And to Ed's concern, if we have a bunch of those small groups, all of a sudden there's a lot more input, I think. And I think we could keep on a, that schedule if we accelerate the small groups, so I encourage that. The districts, I'm not a huge fan of these districts, to be honest. Um, I like to think of the downtown as downtown. Um, entertainment, I agree, is a bad name for a district. And the reality is the arts district is just as much entertainment as the entertainment district. So, um, but I'm not, I, I don't have a hang up on it. Um, as far as the drawings, one of the things that I would like to see perhaps is, um, and it relates to some fundamental transportation things that we still haven't agreed to, and at least in my view, is it would be really cool to see some of those drawings with, in fact, a pedestrian only zone. Just so, just how, see how important those drawings were to all this committee, to how it, in, you know, um, moved them. The same would be effective on a pedestrian only section. So this is my thought, Fred. The seven and 800 block is the steepest sections of the street. It's also the center of this town. Let's do a little design study on what that would look and feel like without the bicycles and without, um, you know, just making it truly pedestrian. So, that's, hang on, this is my time, not yours. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you. So that's one I would really love to see. And I think it would be helpful for everyone to see that nice artistic form and work as a pretty radical alternative to what the city's really currently, transportation wants us to buy it off on, which is, the, keeping the bicycle all the way down and using it as a transportation cord, corridor. I don't think it has to be that. I think you need to get people downtown. It doesn't need to be a corridor. That's my own personal view. So that's, one, uh, that's my one request for you. But the drawings were awesome, and um, thank you for them. They're, they're, they're helpful for people. Fred? Dave, I need, because I've been listening, I need to dive into Please. Give, 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 give the microphone, please. Just hold it up. I wanted to show you all 10 blocks with those drawings that you just said. They're done. I have them. They're finished. I did two versions of the center. I did, I did the wow factor. The, the, the rail streetcar is on those drawings with a turnaround at each end. But I was told I couldn't talk about that. I don't know why. But I was told by several people, you're not allowed to tell you what I should have shown you today was all 10 blocks because they're already drawn. They're drawn in three different versions. Your, the two versions you just described, it's already drawn. Hey, Fred, hang on. Okay. Okay. I, I, so, I, no, hang, hang on. I'm to hold my temper, but I hang on. Tell you. Hey, hang on. 
you know, we did make a decision today to introduce what we're doing and basically bring those drawings into the small groups and bring them to the public in the springtime. So you, you, thank you, thank you, thank you in that regard. Michael. Add my appreciation to that rogues gallery over there against the wall. The, co the couple of you I know know exactly who I'm talking about <laughs> as rogues, but uh, um, especially Anthony, not especially you're a rogue, but uh, for uh, volunteering and shepherding that group of architects together to help push us along out of this conundrum, um, I think uh, uh, just there, there will not be enough thanks for you to, for the work you've done and I know what you'll continue to do. So, so thank you for that. Um, I'm just gonna talk about the bullets that resonate for me. Um, I'm agnostic on the district naming areas. I hear both the chicken and the egg um, arguments and I just, I'm not, I'm not confident enough to know that we have a chicken and we can produce an egg or we need an egg to produce a chicken. So. Um, you know why I use that anecdotal story, yeah. Um, but uh, I don't recall anybody, you know, posterizing the funk zone before it became the funk zone, but now I can certainly go find a sign on every street pole that declares it is the funk zone too. So um, um, I like the drawings. The drawings are just drawings, and I'm not a subject matter expert on the, uh, the Santa Barbara character. I leave that to others. Um, but in particular, I like the, uh, I think, su I, at least in this room, the sudden um, emphasis on paseos. Um, you know, one of my favorite paseos is uh, the parking lot at City Hall through the parking lot at the building that shall rename Nameless next door, <laughs> through the parking lot of that other tall white building there, and then through our lot 10 parking lot and out onto the street, and I'm two blocks down, and then on your drawing, you actually showed a way to get down there, but I'm looking at the little alley behind Joe's going, where's that going, how do we get through it? And then how do I eventually get all the way down behind uh, World Market, right? And so um, what I'd like to see would also be an effort for you to look for places like that where maybe you might scoff and say there's no chance in hell in the future, but you never know, to Peter's point, when somebody's gonna do a building and you can negotiate as part of the process to get some space. So whether that's like, did we lose, lose an opportunity to come in off State Street and turn back down to, is that Ortega or Coda, when, when the, on the restoration hardware project? I don't know, but nobody brought it up and said, hey, how do we, how do we get 15 or 20 feet in here and we'll give you another, another little space of a higher, higher elevation to make up for that lost, lost space, but we build a new Paseo where there was a building. I'm sure these places exist all over the city when you're looking at it from the top down and you're saying, yeah, yeah, if we had here, we had there, or if you could grab some land here or there. So I'd really like to see where in the future those opportunities should, uh, could be and see those recognized now so that we know when we do see projects coming, we can get out in front of that. Same thing for buildings that are in the way. I'll just um, use uh, a couple of my favorite, uh, favorite examples, and that would be the four or five parcels on the east side of State Street against De La Guerra Plaza, and I know one's a historical building, so just give me a little latitude here. But Darn if 50 years from now, the city didn't find a way to take care of that, and the entire plaza went from where City Hall is all the way over to where the new Paseo Nuevo starts. Um, my other example would be somewhere on the 800 or 900 block of State Street where there's a, a third of a block taken up by a 50, 50 foot high blank wall bank. That is, that is not what should be sit in today, should not be sitting on State Street as part of where we wanna go in the future. And how can we incentivize those owners who are also sitting on 10,000 square feet of a bank and to incentivize those, those owners to do something else with that property and bring it into what you're looking at for the future. Um, I'd also like to see more suggestions for urban forests, particularly canopy trees built into the center of blocks, whether they're in the Paseos or not. Um, 
the examples I saw today were what to do lining State Street and maybe some landscaping on Paseos, but I think uh, um, somebody had an example of Paseo being where um, Grassini Winery is and the inside of El Paseo there. It's not a tree to be found in that courtyard, not a tree of, of significance. And why is that? I don't know. And what can we do, what can we do to incentivize that or help that along? Um, and then Paseo Nuevo is coming whether we're ready for it or not. I mean, or it's not, but I, today it is. It's coming whether, we're, okay, Debbie Downer. But today it's coming whether we're ready for it or not. And it's going to drastically change State Street whether we're ready or not. So I think we should be ready. I think we should be going great guns on this process and, and putting ourselves in position to be ready for this, to be ready for the De La Guerra Plaza project, to be ready when the underpass is done under the freeway, to be ready with whatever the heck happens with the news press building, to sit by and, and um, uh, look for the perfect or, or whatever process we have to do. I think we need to move with some some alacrity towards a plan so that we at least have something to start with to be ready because a plan is only a plan you can always change the plan once you need to change the plan and then um last couple points you know i uh, this this question of state street and pedestrians cars and bikes in my I, so i think you probably going to hear it from every council member because we're the ones who are playing defense every day, constantly. Um, it needs to be resolved, and it needs to be resolved sooner than when we get a nice packet and it says, well, here's kind of our plan, but to go back to the best narrative I, I've heard you say last year, Dave, that 100 years ago, the city didn't just automatically become Santa Barbara. It took decades to do it, and I don't want anybody I don't want I don't want to sit in this chair and continue to defend what we want to do in terms of those three shared groups and I don't want the next person to sit in this chair as the plan is taking decades to work out and continually have to defend the choices of pedestrians bicycles and cars we need we need to we need to figure out what that is and then finally there's I think I, I think people, again, need to know that this is going to be a multi-decade project and there's going to be some really tough choices to make in terms of um, priorities and dollar decisions. And it's not going to be, it's certainly not going to get easier into the future. And um, we need to know that it doesn't just happen. We need, I think we need to accept that it doesn't just turn out looking like a pretty picture that Fred drew on the screen. There's going to be... There's going to be uh, uh, wins, there's going to be losses, there's going to be arguments, but um, to sit here, I'll, I'll, I'll end with my favorite Jerry Brown 1.0 1. 1. Uh, quote, and that's, uh, to do nothing is to do something, and we really need to move on doing something before we do nothing. Great. Thank, Thank you. you, Michael. Good quote. Kristen. Uh, appropriate, I would like to throw in a comment um, in part of the discussion. Yeah, let, let's get through these guys okay. and I'll, I'll come back to you guys. Kristen. I can be very succinct because so much of what has been said here around the table for comments reflects the expertise that we have sitting around this table. And really what I want to say about tonight is I feel far more confident that we can get there by the dates um, that have been prescribed um, but with two requests, through the small groups and with this group, mm -hmm. with these types of drawings, with requesting this type of input. Um, this is how it's, I feel far more confident we can get this done now. I do want to say about naming that uh, I appreciate that people who've said they don't feel strongly about this at the chamber and in the business, we kind of do. We really want these zones to be named. And I don't know if I like district or zone, but I love the idea of going to the public on this. And I do think it's important yeah. that it be named what we really call it. Because you know in this town we do the opposite. We <laughs> all know what we're talking about, but we don't ever say though, except for maybe this funk zone. And the last thing on naming is, what happened to Grand Paseo? At one point that was a choice for the <laughs> central. Yeah, Fred's gonna jump out of his seat. Not <laughs> is that bad? I liked it, okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, good, thank you. Yeah. 
Nadra. by thanking the architecture group that came and presented uh, the drawings and bringing the poetry back to this conversation. Also thanking um, the ecological uh, framework from CEC. Uh, a lot of um, the concepts in there and, and their framework uh, are reflective and uh, some of the guidelines that um, we are ex working on um, right now. Um, I also, as we're going around the room, I have, you know, similar thoughts in terms of um, the Paseos. I think that it was great to see that uh, the level of connectivity to State Street and while there may be some ideas of that not necessarily being the focus that we need right now, this has been a slow process and, and I just, I think about respecting that process and so much of, I wanna say like the first six, maybe seven months of this, our conversation focused 90% on mobility, on whether we're gonna be open to cars and, and pedestrians and cyclists and how we're going to work through that. And we're still in that process and it is somewhat cir circular, and and that I believe that that's okay because we're refine every time we get back to a certain topic, we refine just a little bit more. And so the the vision that we were able to have in this meeting, it, it was it, it crystallized in a way that we haven't seen in some of in, in some of our previous meetings. So I just say all that to say to say that I feel that we are on the right track, similar to uh, Kristen's uh, comment, and uh, and this is the time that we really start making those tough decisions. I, I think that we've really crystallized on the idea of what we want this vision to be, what we want the guidelines to be. Like we're all in agreement in the um, in these ideas and these concepts, but now we really need to dig in to some of the other comments, Megan, Ed, and, and in terms of the implementation, the decisions that are going to really um, make this master plan um, and looking over my notes, I think, oh, I, I, I really enjoyed the, the trees and using the trees to create this this uh, placemaking, um, using it as a way to connect, uh, using them as gateways, um, using them as canopies. Also, to Mike's point, one of the, the thoughts that I had is when expanding out those paseos, building more out into the, the natural spaces, urban forests, parks, um, at being able to activate those spaces, um, those Paseo spaces um, in those ways. So I think that's all I have. Thank you. Suzanne, you have a question? This is to um, staff and the architect group. Um, Anthony, you mentioned a couple of things in your presentation about a design strategies, what you guys are working on, uh, a toolkit, a kit of parts. Um, and 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 I understand we're you know dealing with general issues and we're trying to di dive in. Um, and then you mentioned the design process. So from this point, I mean forward, what is that design process? Where, what is that design process going to be? And what is, I know that the next few months are going to be very critical. And the small groups I think are a great way to engage the State Street Committee. Um, so my question is what is this design process that you guys are going to be engaging in with staff? Yeah, so, um, it, yeah okay. Um, so I think there's a couple of, of pieces and I think to first recognize just that um, this is none, this is nothing, we're, none of us are professionals at this process. <laughs> um, this is a, a once in a long time kind of thing. So I think there are some bumps along the road and there's maybe ways that we, things could be worked through a little better or worse. Um, and so, but I, I think all in all, it's going pretty quickly compared to a lot of master plan processes. Um, so, and this actually ties to the Fred's comments as well and his, some of his frustration. Uh, there, uh, there are, there's a couple of things happening, and I was well to Ed, Ed's uh, 
frustration as well, or not frustration, but desire to have HLC give commentary and planning commission those. I think those are going to be really valuable, and I think that the faster and better we can get input from everyone and get feedback um, and let it keep informing the plan, because part of this is this is the first time that you saw a Santa Barbara version play out of this. And so I, know, I think it was uh, in discussion with staff, that was part of the reason for um, uh, while um, Fred has all, this, all the blocks drawn to a certain level, as you also saw, a lot of it's not coordinated. So, um, you know, we're working things out as we go. So you're seeing basically the process. You're seeing the sausage made. So um, it's not, it's not pretty in some ways, and there's bumpy in others. Um, there is more to see, but there, that actually needs to be processed a little bit more, um, and then it could be reviewed well, in my opinion. Um, and I think it could be reviewed now, but I think uh, we don't have time to do everything all at once, and we certainly have been uh, <laughs> condensing down to a very uh, extreme uh, level, and Fred's been working on that charge the whole way and uh, a number of the other team members as well as we iterate. So you're seeing a sort of iteration process, you know, um, uh, Justin's sketches that he talked about in Brown, those are his initial sketches studies showing the concept, not a particular block, and just the concept of Paseo intersecting and landscape intersecting with State Street. So that was valuable, but not tied to, uh, you know, in any of the particular blocks on State Street that actually show that. So. Part of it is this, you're, it's a messy process right now. We're going, kind of we're shredding. We're going as fast as we can and to work these things out. So I think they will be worked out more. I do think the more we can get public input, the, sm the small group input, HLC input, everyone's input, the better, because we can be reworking and the decisions that will need to be made. So if you guys like the way things are going in general, I think that you're going to be seeing options and you're going to be seeing other things. So um, don't worry, Fred, I promise everything, you <laughs> everything will be shown at one point. They will be voting one way or the other. Well, Anthony, I, I appreciate I that. I've done master planning at this level before, okay? And, and what, what's going to happen next and everything that uh, Anthony just said is going to hold true. So we're still trying to work this out. And remember, there's, we're all in different places. I'm, I'm working out of my house on a little 36-inch desk. These guys get to have computers and do all that kind of stuff, and it was really hard. So there's a lot of coordination, and, and Ed's absolutely right. It hasn't been coordinated. That's coming next. But in this process, we show you all of it. You then look at it as a committee and say, no, that's not an idea we want to even go there. That's a great idea. Can you develop that further? Um, Mr. Jordan's comment about Delaguerra Plaza. That's already sketched. I've already got that sketch done, showing an opening up to State Street. But it may not be what you want, but you need to see it. Um, the issues that you need to help the designers, the guys doing the pretty pictures, is exactly what Mr. Jordan said, what uh, Peter said, et cetera. You need, to, you need to decide on the mobility issue. Because right now, the drawings I've done were based on everything I've been listening to in all the meetings I've attended here, that I've listened to my colleagues in the 2020 uh, AIA charrette, the things I've been listening, I pay attention, I listened all the time to HLC and the Planning Commission, that's what the drawings now reflect. As I said, I'm your draftsman. So some of it shows blocks with nothing on it except pedestrians. Some of it shows blocks with traffic on it. Some of it shows bikes on it. Some show bike lanes, no bike lanes. Those drawings are done. But you as a committee need to look at them and decide, yes, we can do that here. No, we can't do that there, et cetera. That's a key component. The other key component is looking at where this housing is going to get concentrated, besides Paseo Nuevo. In looking at all those parcels, all that research I did, I discovered what I thought were all kinds of separate little parcels is actually a one-person owner owns an acre and a half in the 600 block. And it's all occupied by single-story retail buildings right now. Well, as Mr. Jordan pointed out, um, that we can incentivize folks to maybe perhaps in the future do something different from that property. That's why we need to be, I, in my opinion, to do a proper master plan, we need to look at both the private parcels 
and the public parcels. We're not going to hurt anybody's feeling. We shouldn't scare anybody. I dealt with this when I worked at San Luis Obispo on their master plan. It took them 20 years to do it, but a lot of what I put in there came to fruition. A lot of what I did didn't come there, didn't happen because of big issues. So that's what's happening next. So Susan, to answer your question, there is a process. We know how to do it. That's what we've been trained to do as architects and planners. And we're gonna help you get there and we're gonna take as much as we can from the entire public and put it in here, but it's in your, your bailiwick to decide to accept it or not accept it. Thank Good. you. Anyway, I'll, oh, there we go. Um, no, I understand that there's a process and I feel it, it's, I think it's important. This committee, we haven't been asked to do design. We haven't been asked specific, we've had a lot of presentations from different um, departments of the city and about what needs to be done and this and that and there's a lot of things to consider and I do really think that these small groups we could, like we can dive into details and we can have these discussions it's really hard in, in a large setting like this to make a decision or to commit so it I'm looking forward to that process Great. Is what thank I'm you, saying. Su thank you Suzanne yes but John gonna go he hasn't spoken go ahead as a, a, the new kid in town uh, who's been looking at this from the outside and also from the perspective of the Planning Commission, first off, I uh, want to thank the architects for actually bringing forward visualizations of what this could be. And I think that's an important thing that's been missing from this process is what it could be. And I remember watching one of these meetings and Chair Davis, he said, you know, there's no wow factor. Well, that, you know, we're, I think we're starting to see at least remnants of what could be a wow factor. And, and part of that's just the process that we're in doesn't sometimes allow us to sort of get into this stuff. You have to deal with system issues first, make those system decisions, which don't necessarily lean you to something that's graphic and something that somebody can feel and touch and, and relate to. So, you know, as somebody that works in doing, you know, basically charrette-based urbanism, uh, you know, unfortunately we sort of didn't do a charrette to start with, which I think we would have been better off doing that first, at first as a community, doing a community charrette and then breaking down to subroots. I, mean, I found that to be the most productive thing I've done professionally is when we've done charrette base and it's like a couple weekends and get the whole community in. But, but we're not there and so we're gonna have to do this sort of in reverse in my opinion. It's, it's, we basically now have to make these big decisions. There's some big decisions that are out there. The community's looking for those decisions. You know, I don't think there's a consensus on some of those issues, but you know, this, uh, I think Megan mo made the comment that, you know, it's going to be a democracy. It's going to be a majority. It, it probably won't be, you know, a unanimous decision. So, but those decisions have to be made so you can actually get to a point in which you can then do the visualization of some of these things. So we, we should need to get to those. I completely agree with uh, Councilman Snedden's comments. I just basically don't want to repeat those, but I think she's, she, she's right on. And what I also see, as uh, uh, Michael Becker noted, is you know, the population issue in housing is something that, you know, you know that's a, a good statistic. We have a situation with the population isn't there to support your downtown. And there's some real big decisions that need to be made by the community to get to those housing decisions that will support what the vision is. And, and, and the sooner that can get to the Planning Commission and sooner we can have those policy discussions, the better. Um, and I, I completely agree with uh, Mr. Lindvik that, that the Commission and the HLC needs to start having conversations about what's being discussed here so at least you get their input instead of it coming as a document 
before us and it's an up and down type question, you should at least get some input early on. So uh, those are my comments at this point. Good, but, thank uh, you. I definitely appreciate the hard work all of you have done because uh, the community is really looking looking towards your, your efforts here. And I think you've done a good job considering this is not an easy thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, John. Hillary, I, we're really tight. It better be good. <laughs> <laughs> we keep mentioning it needs to go back to HLC, it needs to go back to Planning Commission. Yes, and that's in the path. The other thing was in a graphic many times during the maintenance process was to go to the Transportation and Circulation Committee. Guess what they work on? The thing we talk about every meeting. <laughs> and it came once. And so I think now is a good time also for back. this to go to that, to talk to the people who talk about this every meeting about what that could look like and that can inform you know coming back to this just like we go to HLC and all those things so I'd really recommend that that happen soon um, I know that that committee which I'm on are like wondering and and hoping to participate in some way um, so I'm hoping that that's still in the plans to come soon again not with a complete document say what do you think but um, to do some of the dirty work Thanks. Hilly, that was really good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to wrap up, guys, and I'm going to be really brief. Um, I love the CEC Ecological Principles. Thanks, staff, for getting that incorporated. Feedback in the small groups. Yes, uh, small groups really work for me, and I think this next phase of small groups, all these hard questions, folks, get ready. Strap in, because we're, we're heading right there real, really fast. Architectural group. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Fred, here's something, man, I gotta tell you. Um, and I know y'all that, and I, I'm gonna take the blame. I said, I don't wanna show the public everything we got. I wanna get a lot more input and basically bring back a plan. We did ask staff to basically take everything we have in here and come back in late spring, early summer, and through the small groups, work through that, including all of the individual drawings that we've got. So um, there is a process get involved, stay involved in that regard. In terms of other things I'd like to see, um, in the, this all came, John, from the, sh the community charrettes. This is really, really, really where it started. And those charrettes also had at least conceptual ideas of housing, w especially within airspace over public spaces. Incorporate that into the plan. Bring concepts of housing into the plan. Don't just talk numbers, bring pictures that basically stimulate the thought in that regard. And yes, Michael, uh, it takes 30 years to do a plan like this. Uh, and I, again, you know, Lee Heller and I are good friends. Uh, you start with, and I, I'm, I've, I've asked staff, you start with looking at imp implementing it immediately, what can we do now? Within the next zero to three years, what can we do and what happens? And then you prioritize what you need to do within the next 10 years, and then you set the framework for the longer 30-year plan so as things go forward, you know where you're going in that regard. In 1964, they showed concept drawings like this of taking off uh, parking on State Street and putting it into private lots. They talked about expanding the sidewalks and narrowing, actually, a, a, a starving the, 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 the road diet, even back then, into two lanes, right? This was essentially radical at the time, as, as we're talking about here. But yet, in the next 20 to 30 years, it all got done, because this community can make it happen in that regard. I want to thank everybody. Your comments tonight were really fantastic. It was a good meeting. Thank you all in that regard. Architects, again. We'll keep working with you in that regard. Tess, good luck. Okay, keep us informed in that regard. Okay, we're looking forward. We're looking forward to the new little planner coming out. Good night, everybody.